Um, again, advise members that the committee will be recorded and, uh, and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and uh, online. And uh, for those in the public gallery, um, keep your devices on airplane mode and the assembly Wi-Fi details are there also there provided for you on the t uh, chairs. And you can't take photographs of the meeting. So, um, <coughs> is anyone anywhere of any apologies? No. Okay. So, uh, can I advise members that the Deputy Chair and I had an informal meeting with RSPB last week. Uh, the papers from the meeting are included in correspondence 40 to 50 in your packs. It focused around the uh, UK Government Bill for Agriculture, Environment and Fisheries. They expressed disappointment that the climate emergency had not been included in the Assembly's legislative programme and outlined their, uh, their farm based solutions to dealing with climate change. In favour of the creation of an independent environment protection agency, have agreed to forward a briefing paper on this, how this will work alongside the NIEA. They said that the environment strategy must be fit for purpose in order to respond to the scale of the climate emergency and will forward the briefing paper to the committee in due course. Um, we also advise members that uh, the two statutory rules revoking the two sea fishing sea fish statutory rules were laid in the business office on Tuesday, 18th of February and we'll make our way to this committee in due course. Uh, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held last Thursday on pages 25 to 30 in your packs. Um, can I seek people's agreement for the minutes? Agreed. 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 Sign them here now. <coughs> uh, any particular matters arising? Okay, can I refer members then to the correspondent index of page 33 in your pack um, and the actions against it. Are members happy with the act, with the act to action the correspondence as suggested? Okay. Um, okay. I should also seek decision on the joint port visit on the 22nd of April. Uh, we suggest that the can the committee defer this decision until after we have strategic planning when it's set when we set the priorities. Okay. Yeah. I refer members also to um, uh, the table of correspondence of page 12 and 13, which is the agenda for the House of Lords EU Select Committee meeting on the 25th of February 2020, which committee chairs have been invited to attend. Okay. Um, in terms of forward work programme, please refer to the forward work programme at page 52 to 55 of your packs. Stella, do you want to brief members yes. on this? Yes, I'm just uh Getting it open here on my new, <laughs> my new tablet. So yes, um, next week um, all those um, stakeholders that are coming on the Environment Bill have now been confirmed. So they they will be coming, um, all of them. And then the week after, for the 5th of March, um, again, all the stakeholders have been confirmed. Um, the stakeholders from um, the, sea, the, from the um, fishermen sector are the... Um, Anglo Northern Ireland, Northern Irish Fish Producers and the Fish Producers Association, the Northern Ireland Fish Harbour uh, Harbours Association, um, our agency have been invited as well. Um, the the Brexit um, and the Environment Academic Group, the two academics that are due to come, are from the UK on that. And again, as normal, the committee would cover transport costs as long as it's economy and kept as low as possible. And I'll, I'll check that happens. <coughs> The one group there that we're missing that um, really only came to my mind once I started reading the information, which I only managed to get to this week, was the processing industry. So the sea, um, seafood and fish processing industry have been missed from there. Um, we managed to identify two possible processors, but if you're happy enough, it means an extra long meeting. If you're happy enough, we can potentially bring two fish processors at the very end of the meeting. I think it's important that you hear from then, is that okay? Person, can I ask, are these all day meetings going to carry on inevitably? No, that's the last one. All right, thanks. That's the last one. And then hopefully, hopefully, depending on workload, we'll be back to half day meetings. Thank you. Okay. So is that okay? Okay. Um, <coughs> so, uh, can I ask you to agree to identify representatives of the fish process industry to provide evidence yeah. on the first bill? Yeah. Yep. And can I seek agreement for the forward work programme? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, we're going to have an oral briefing from the Research and Information Service. Uh, 
is in 100, it's in page 15 to 40 of the table of papers and I'd like to welcome Mark Allen here, he's no stranger to the committee, so Mark, good to see you and I want to uh, give the opportunity now to brief the committee. Thank you Chair and thank you Members and as you say it's pages 15 to 40 in your table of papers, you better leave to know I'm not going to go through every page. Um, I suppose sufficient to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, in very basic terms, the, the briefing paper provides an overview uh, of the key elements of the UK Agriculture Bill 2019-20. to This, as Stella had already mentioned to you earlier, is actually a, a successor uh, bill almost, because mm -hmm. the previous Agriculture Bill actually fell uh, as a result of the, the general election um, in 2019. Um, the paper I have I've written actually focuses on the Northern Ireland specific components of the bill, some of which are unique to here. Uh, but it also looks at some of the wider UK elements which still require legislative consent uh, from the Assembly. I have to say, due to both the, the complexity um, of the Bill, uh, and I've probably got off lightly here compared to Susie next week, uh, but on the time that we had, it's not as comprehensive a product as we would normally try to produce, but we've tried to really focus in, as I said, on both those areas which are maybe potential issues and specific questions for Northern Ireland. So with that in mind, um, I just want to give you a brief overview. I also thought it was useful maybe in relation to some of the stakeholders coming in later, that we give you a bit of contextual information in relation both to where agriculture is at this point in time and as well in terms of agri-food, uh, the wider the food processing industry. So pages 16 to 22 of your table papers gives you both a, an overview of, of agriculture. I don't have time to go into this in detail. A couple of headlines really I suppose I would leave with you maybe to, to inform your thinking, but again the information is there if you want to refer to it. Agriculture, it has to be said, is relatively more significant in Northern Ireland than any other part of the UK, both in terms of employment and economic contribution. And as such, anything that affects the sector, either negatively or positively, can have significant impacts. It's also, I think, fairly evident you would have been living in a cave not to realise that direct payments are critical to the survival of the industry in the short term, never mind the long term sustainability of it. Many farms. Um, really rely on this as their source of income and without it the, the figures are quite stark. We also in Northern Ireland have a, a high level of less favoured or areas of natural constrained lands, about 70%. Um, that can present challenges for farm profitability, particularly when it's combined with the fact that we have a very average or small average farm size. And we also rely heavily on livestock, uh, cattle and sheep. And that can make us particularly sensitive maybe in relation to any changes to policy affecting those, those sectors. Migrant labour is a very topical issue, as Stella mentioned to you earlier. I have to say in relation to agriculture, based on, on Dara's data, it's not as critical an issue here because of the nature of our agriculture, but that's not to downplay the significant impact that any changes could have in the horticultural sector and the seasonal nature probably of employment. Very quickly then in relation to food processing, and that's pages 22 to 25. Some of the headlines from that. Food and drink processing is a very significant part of our economy. It actually contributes more in terms of gross value added than farming. Um, whilst the sector's many subsectors, the most significant in terms of turnover, employment and sales are the beef and sheep meat, uh, milk and milk products and the poultry meat sectors. And the health of those is directly linked, it has to be said fairly obviously, to having local farmers to produce product to be able to process. The EU is a significant export for local produce, particularly the Republic of Ireland, but overall terms GB accounts for the greatest proportion of sales outside Northern Ireland. A number of subsectors are probably more reliant on EU exports than others, milk and milk products, fish and drinks, and as such could face greater impacts if there are any trading changes there. But equally, as I said to you, in terms of the east-west movement of goods, anything that it could impact there will obviously create problems as well. Exports to the rest of the world from here are relatively small. Uh, there is potential area for growth, but I, I haven't featured that really in the paper. In terms of food processors, too, the level of profitability for a number of subsectors is relatively low. It could be adversely affected, as I say there, if, if costs to access markets increase. Or it could even potentially affect the viability of, of individual businesses. In terms of migrant labour, this is the area that I suppose we're most exposed on, uh, particularly from the rest of the EU, and it's a key component of our food processing workforce. And I'll touch on it later, but particularly in relation to the Home Secretary's announcements yesterday, 
I think the debate will rage as to how much of that labour is skilled as well and where that would fall with any proposed change to the system. In basic terms, and very quickly on the, the bill, um, the bill, as, as Stella had intimated in closed session, is really to provide a legislative framework for agriculture and more specifically agricultural support schemes across the UK. Whilst the predominant um, focus is on England, there are clauses which do relate to and apply to Northern Ireland, and Schedule 6 is specific to Northern Ireland. <coughs> If you look at you at page 26 in your table paper, I've just included a table which highlights those parts, those clauses and those schedules which both apply to Northern Ireland and which require the legislative consent of, or for which the legislative consent of the Assembly is being sought. So I want to then move on just very quickly to the actual clauses themselves and this will be a very much a run through but you have the papers there. I'm more than happy to take questions at the end. I may not be able to answer them all, in fact I'm fairly confident I won't, but I think that's part of the, the process in relation to this bill and some of the issues pertaining to it. Mm -hmm. In terms of clause 17 there, um, then just to start, this is page 27, food security. This I suppose is interesting because it places a, a new duty on the DEFRA Secretary of State to produce and lay a report at least once every five years on UK food security. There's a number of themes that that can cover. Ones that I suppose may be of interest to us are both resilience for the supply chain of food and household food security and expenditure in food. Um, a number of these features for members from previous committees too had been looked at, for example, in the previous Going for Growth Agri-Food Strategy. Never really, I suppose, got to the point of, of fully working those out into a, a successor document, but I suppose other jurisdictions have looked at that. In terms of key questions uh, around the food security issue, the clause undoubtedly commits the government uh, to complete a report, but it's significant there's no commitment to action. So if they find something, um, there's not necessarily a commitment to do anything about it. There's also as, as a quite a familiar theme here, no indication of additional resources at either a national or devolved level to address any of the identified issues. And I think particularly if to, to really focus on Northern Ireland here, in light of the withdrawal agreement um, and the potential impacts from the Northern Ireland Protocol, there is a possibility, according to some, that food prices here could rise. Um, and I think that they may, you know, some people will say they may even be higher than they will be in GB. In that regard, consumers here may have less choice at a household level. And I think there may be, there may be our questions, could that clause be amended either to include uh, a potential Northern Ireland specific consideration, or is that maybe even something that could be of merit within a Northern Ireland bill if such was coming forward? Moving on then to part four, uh, clause 31 on fertilisers. The bill um, effectively amends the Agriculture Act 1970, and that's, I suppose, it has been done really to try and reflect changes that are being made in the fertiliser industry. I'm not going to dwell on those, um, but the, the bit that is of interest in this, um, I suppose, is that we rely heavily on chemical fertilisers at this time, due to the fact that we have, I suppose, a largely pasture-based system in terms of livestock <coughs> raising. So, Fertiliser is something that is, is, is regularly used uh, and I suppose is a key component of our agricultural system. The interesting part of this clause is that it would enable the, the bringing forward of regulations which would both amend and repeal EU regulation 2003-2003, which currently regulates areas including fertiliser composition, labelling and traceability. Now, what does this mean? Well, one of the questions, a key one here is, is will the power to either amend or repeal the EU regulation 2003-2003 actually extend to Northern Ireland? The reason I say that is that that regulation is actually referenced with an Annex 2 of the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, and that would suggest that variation here will not be possible. As an added complication, that regulation I just mentioned, 2003-2003, is actually set for repeal and will be replaced on a phased basis by EU Regulation 2019-1009, and that comes into force on the 16th of July 2022. That new regulation does include new provisions allowing the use of biostimulants and soil conditioners, which might be the direction of travel that GB wants to go in, um, and would also, at the EU level, introduce limits for toxic contaminants. Now, the difficulty in relation to this is that an Various analysis that you will read in relation to the um, protocol is that, to all intents and purposes, it appears that Northern Ireland will need to automatically adopt any changes to the regulations set out <coughs> in Annex 2 of the protocol. And that would include the one I've just referenced. 
Significantly, new areas of regulation can also be added to the protocol through agreement of the Joint Committee. The one I'm talking about here is probably just by default would happen. Um, in these instances, I suppose a critical question for us is how can a local voice be there, heard or listened to? So if we have a particular need or a particular issue in Northern Ireland, how can that be reflected in those circumstances? <coughs> the other point to make on this is that uh, Northern Ireland-based sellers and users will potentially not be able to benefit from the proposed changes in GB unless they're matched in changes to EU law. So in effect, the question I'm asking, will GB manufactured fertilisers made the new B GB standards still be available here? Particularly uh, in a situation where you would have regulatory divergence. So GB goes this way, the EU goes this way. What happens in terms of the types of fertilisers we can access? I think there's a useful question to ask in terms of where is the fertiliser we use here at present, where is it sourced from? Is it GB, is it ROI or is it wider EU? And the other question is what impact um, will these proposed changes potentially have in the local fertiliser market, both in terms of choice and competitiveness? And I think the fundamental for the farmer is our fertiliser cost likely to rise or fall in light of this. Moving on then just to um, Clause 32, which is the identification and traceability of animals. This clause amends Section 89 of the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act uh, by adding a clause which will enable the DEFRA Minister to assign functions to an assigned body that would include uh, functions that are exercis exercisable across the entire UK. In this instance, the Delegated uh, Powers Memorandum that accompanies the bill identifies the assigned body as the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board. The actual functions that will be performed by the ADHB um, are the collection, management and making available of information um, around the identification, movement and health of animals. In terms of what that will actually mean, the Welsh Government um, is of the opinion that it will enable the ADHB to approve the format of animal ID tags, whilst the Commons um, Library briefing paper actually makes reference to the management of a proposed livestock information system for the UK uh, that is expected to be delivered by late 2020. The questions I have really around this is, uh, are these. Is the ADHB going to have any role to perform within Northern Ireland in relation to animal identification and traceability? Um, how would any such role either supplement or replace what DARA is currently doing? I'm particularly thinking of NIFIUS here. And with regards to the potential powers for the ADHB to approve the animal identification tags, I think the fundamental question is, are these going to be cognizant of Northern Ireland's ongoing commitment to align with EU identif animal identification regulations as set out in Annex 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? As things stand, Annex 2 identifies Council Regulations 21-2004, 1760-2000, and 2008-71 as continuing to apply within Northern Ireland as they apply to sheep and goats and cattle and pigs, respectively. Um, the other issue I mentioned already, NIFIUS, will the entry of the NIFIUS data be a key component of this proposed uh, UK livestock information system? And I think we have to ask a fundamental question in this instance, will, will actually NIFIUS be able to and ready to provide that data by the end of 2020? Is that a critical issue? Um, and to in effect, are there any issues or concerns around the interface between NIFIUS and the proposed LIS? And I suppose what I'm, I'm really boiling down again to is, does the operation of the Northern Ireland Protocol present any particular challenges in relation to that issue beyond the UK transition period? On page 29 of your table of papers then is uh, clauses 36 to 37 deal with organic products. As the target already intimated earlier, uh, organic production here is very small at this point in time. Uh, the last data I had looked at in relation to 2018 was that organic production was about 0.8% of Northern Ireland's total agricultural area, as compared to an overall UK figure of 3.1%. There could, however, it has to be said, be a potential for growth in the sector here, given trends towards sustainable agriculture and a growing emphasis on, on food provenance uh, amongst consumers. Clauses 36 and 37 then I suppose actually deal with organic certification, the import and the export of organic products and the enforcement of organic regulation. And Clause 37 in particular extends these powers to ministers within the devolved administrations, including Northern Ireland where they have legislative competence. 
Key questions here is, does DERA have any plans to utilise those powers uh, through regulation? Um, and any of those areas I mentioned? Has there been any assessment made as to whether utilisation of, of such powers would either boost organic production or the processing of organic produce here? Also, um, and I fundamentally again linked to the protocol, there's quite a common theme you'll be picking up here. Would we actually be able to use these potential powers, given the fact that Northern Ireland is required again to adhere to EU rules on organic production and labelling? And that's the result of Regulation uh, 834-2007, which again is an integral part of Annex 2 of the protocol. As an added complication, similar to fertilisers, uh, that actual regulation is being repealed from the 1st of January 2021 and being replaced by 2018-848. This new regulation is also found with an Annex 2 of the protocol. I think, again, a common theme. Has there been any assessment done by the Department of the risk of regulatory divergence between GB and the EU being take, undertaken in relation to organic standards and any likely impact this could have on either local producers or processors? Moving on to clauses 40 to 42, um, these extend and apply to Northern Ireland, uh, but the Assembly's legislative consent is not being sought, despite agriculture support being a devolved matter. The reason I focused on these is because the, the Scots and the Welsh have lodged their unhappiness uh, in relation to this, and I think there's, there are issues to explore for ourselves as well. To give you a brief, uh, and it is a brief, um, clauses 40 to 42 really enable the, the DEFRA minister the UK Agriculture Minister, to make regulations in order to secure the UK's compliance with the World Trade Organization rules in agriculture. Um, those are really set out in the World Trade Organization's Agreement on Agriculture, and under those, all members and signatories have obligations to meet in relation to areas of market access, domestic support of agriculture, and export competition. Um, in effect, these clauses give the, the DEFRA Minister powers to limit domestic support for farmers across the UK in order to ensure overall UK compliance with WTO requirements. The reason being that, as Stella had intimated um, to you previously, the UK government argues these are a reserve matter because the UK is a WTO member and it's their responsibility to ensure compliance. Um, Whilst the clauses do suggest there could be a, a potential for diversity in the approaches taken across the UK in terms of how we approach our support for agriculture, the government will be the ultimate arbiter as to whether such variations are allowed. And as a result, uh, these clauses due particular criticism from both the Scottish and Welsh governments um, as they were introduced in the preceding bill. The Welsh government's response uh, was that they actually signed a memorandum of understanding in March 2019 with the government that sought to secure a process <coughs> whereby the Welsh Government would be consulted and agreements sought where possible. That was within the context that ultimately the Government would say, well, we will still decide. But there is at least an MOU was, was drawn at that time. The Scottish Government didn't go down that route. Uh, they continued to oppose. And that actually led DEFRA to publish a so-called uh, Scotland Mythbuster, where they tried to effectively set out um, and refute Scottish claims of a power grab. Um, that, I'll read it just a quick quote from that, the document included the following paragraphs in relation to the powers around the WTO in the previous bill. Uh, the Scottish Government has claimed powers enabling us to comply with our WTO obligations should be exercised jointly. However, the Scottish Parliament does not have the legal competence to act in this area. Whilst this is a reserved matter, the UK Government will work closely with the devolved administrations in this, given their interest, just as we did ahead of the Agriculture Bill's introduction. The Scotland Mythbuster that was published then too also stated that Wales and Northern Ireland had accepted the UK Government's offer to extend powers in the Agriculture Bill to the devolved administrations, which would enable them to create their own farm and support systems. Uh, and these powers, they said, are encapsulated uh, within the Northern Ireland specific and the Welsh specific schedules within the current bill. Key questions here is, uh, what is the Executive's position in relation to clauses 4042 within the Agriculture Bill? Is the Executive content? for DEFRA to exercise these powers in relation to maintaining UK compliance with the, the WTO requirements? Does the Executive have any plans to negotiate a memorandum of understanding similar to Wales in relation to those issues raised? If not, is the Executive confident that it will be both consulted and listened to with regards to its views and the level of farm support that it wishes to utilise within Northern Ireland? And I have to say to you, with regard to the DEFRA Minister being potentially able to set farm subsidy limits, 
uh, has any consideration been given to additional limits or complexities that could be imposed due to the state aid requirements uh, detailed within Article 10 and Annex 6 of the Northern Ireland Protocol as they relate to agricultural support? In particular, what role, if any, will the Joint Committee that will operate the, the protocol um, have in ensuring that Northern Ireland subsidies are compliant with the WTO AOA? Uh, will DEFRA and the Joint Committee have the same opinion here? And if they don't, whose opinion takes precedence? Now, I say that within the context of trying to read the state aid rules within the protocol and continuing to scratch my head as to how, a, what it means and b, how it would operate. But I don't think that's unusual. I think a lot of people are continuing to grapple with it. But I think it's, it's a pertinent point to raise, and it's one that we may not get answers on, but it's one to raise. Very quickly then on Schedule 6, um, which is the bit that specifically deals with Northern Ireland. There are five parts. Um, this is on page 32 of your table papers. Financial support um, after EU exit, um, I think significantly, uh, and as the clerk had, had, I suppose, has, and others have raised, there is a level of flexibility here that maybe other parts of the UK don't have. Um, whilst Schedule 6 is broadly similar to a lot of the provisions as the early thing, and there are noticeable uh, differences. Uh, we aren't terminating direct payments. Uh, in fact, there is, is the power for, for DERA to extend the basic payment scheme for one or more years beyond 2020. There's also quite a, a deal of significance in the fact that um, part one of the schedule, more specifically paragraph 2.1b, would give DERA potentially additional powers to modify legislation to make areas uh, of natural <coughs> constraint payments possible. This is significant, given that 2018 was the, the last year in which the previous ANC support scheme operated. Additionally, uh, paragraph 4 of, of part 1 would enable DERA to modify legislation to enable the continuation of coupled support, which that wasn't something that we utilised um, within the existing cap. There is obviously there a provision that that could be revisited. For those maybe who are new to this, um, the idea of, of that is that you actually, um, in terms of coupled support, you give direct aid that can be linked to production of a particular sector that can be struggling. So in, in Scotland, for example, that has been done for, for, for sheep and for cattle and recognition of the conditions that farmers are operating in. Um, also, powers under paragraph 6 of the schedule will enable DERA to modify or retain the EU legislation as it relates to rural development provisions. So I suppose the questions I have there is is the DERA Minister committed to the long-term utilisation of direct payments to farmers beyond 2021? Um, is he committed to bringing forward a, a new support scheme for areas of natural constraint? Um, is the Minister actively exploring or supporting the introduction of coupled support provisions? If yes, what specifically is being considered? Um, is the Minister equally committed to continuing wider rural development support in line with existing provisions for schemes such as LEADER? And if not, does DERA plan to seek access to a dedicated rural component of the proposed uh, UK Share Prosperity Fund that will replace existing EU structural funds? Now, I'm saying all of those in the context of those provisions are undoubtedly there to give flexibility. I suppose the question remains is, will that flexibility be utilised by the Minister? The other thing I want to say is on that is, um, and it's the fundamental in all of this is, is DERA confident that funding can be secured? So there is flexibility, but that flexibility will obviously require support to enable it to be developed fully uh, and on an ongoing basis. And as a general question, would any of these provisions, if they are utilised, potentially present any particular challenges with meeting the state aid requirements that I mentioned previously in Article 10 and Annexes 5 and 6 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? Part two of Schedule 6 then deals with intervention on agricultural markets. Uh, broadly similar to, to England, I suppose the difference to England is that, <coughs> unlike in England, there's no provision for the Secretary of State or the Minister here to make and publish a declaration of so-called exceptional market conditions, which would there, there in England justify uh, powers of intervention. The terminology actually used in Northern Ireland is set out there in, on page 33 of the paper. But the, the, the key thing that is effective this is to enable is intervention to the point of payment um, and the use of resources where there is a severe disturbance in agricultural markets or a serious threat of a severe disturbance and the disturbance or threatened disturbance has or is likely to have a significant adverse impact on uh, agricultural producers in terms of prices achievable for one or more agricultural products. Key questions there, 
What constitutes a severe disturbance or a threat of the same in agriculture markets? How is DARA going to make that assessment? What criteria will be used? Will there be any limits on the type, frequency or levels of support that could be utilised? How would it be financed? Again, would it be a UK government contribution or would this come from the Northern Ireland Block Grant? <coughs> and will these provisions of utilised be again compliant with state aid requirements uh, in the protocol? Particularly um, challenge here in relation to goods that might be moving between Northern Ireland and the EU. Okay. Um, I had a couple of points in relation to marketing standards and uh, carcass classification. I'm not going to dwell on those because I'm conscious of time. I'm going to jump the, very quickly jump on to, to general observations relating to the bill. Um, finance is my, my big one um, because I think we, we still have a lack of clarity as to what the situation there is. Um, the government has committed to guaranteeing the annual budget to farmers in every year of the parliament. Some people have taken that as a five-year commitment. Slight difficulty with that is that the government uh, had the Conservative Party manifesto included a commitment to repeal the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. And indeed, uh, this week, there has actually been um, a bill introduced in the House of Lords to repeal the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. So there's a level of uncertainty there. Secondly, uh, we know from Treasury statements prior to Christmas um, the allocation of money that Northern Ireland is getting within this year and indeed beyond uh, into 2020-2021. But the question we have is really beyond that period uh, as to what happens. <coughs> to give us an added complexity to the BU review, which really had looked, I suppose, into um, payments and Northern Ireland's share and how pay payments would be allocated, um, acknowledged that Northern Ireland's share of UK agricultural funding would decline if the government adopted a per hectare convergence allocation formula, which is what they recommended. Um, the review also re recommended the adoption of the preferred formula should be accompanied by a modest sum from the Exchequer to offset the reductions that DERA would face. But it seems clear from that that I think DERA and Northern Ireland will have a battle uh, on their hands in relation to the allocation of resources. Uh, so the key questions there are what assurances has, has DARA sought from DEFRA in relation to the availability of UK funding for direct payments post-transition? Is DARA confident that, that current funding levels for direct payments will be maintained by the UK, UK government for a period beyond the transition period? And really what challenges will we face in securing a fair share? The one I want to say a bit more on is, is the bill compliant with the Northern Ireland or Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, for those of you again who will be, have and keeping an eye on this. The Nor Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol is effectively the means by which the free movement of goods in the island of Ireland is, is secured, regardless of whether the UK and the EU actually successfully negotiate a trade deal. Amongst other things, the, the protocol effectively binds Northern Ireland to a series of EU regulations as they relate to a range of goods, with agricultural products, I have to say, being particularly prominent. Adherence to these regulations is how Northern Ireland will be able to access the single market, an annex two of the, the protocol, which if any of you looked at will know how substantial it is, lists all those requirements. As I said earlier, too, it's also useful to note that Northern Ireland is also required to automatically adopt any changes to the EU regulation listed in Annex 2. Any new regulations as they relate to agri-food products and manufactured goods can be added to Annex 2, just to make you aware of that as well, provided that's agreed by the Joint Committee which will also oversee the operation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And the Joint Committee is to be made up of representatives from the EU and UK, but it remains unclear at this time as to how it will actually function. Um, as I mentioned, the state aid rules, again, those relate to areas covered within the protocol and which involve trade between Northern Ireland and the EU. How will we differentiate that? That could be an, an, a, an administrative burden, a nightmare on its own. Whilst the Joint Committee will have a key role to play, it's also used to remember that the European Commission and the European Court of Justice will ultimately have responsibility and powers to ensure that Northern Ireland adheres to the rules it's required to. So my question here is, um, have these provisions uh, been tested to see, and the provisions in the bill, have they been tested to see if they're compliant with the Northern Ireland <coughs> Protocol? And if the protocol limits or restrict some of the proposed provisions within the bill, does this potentially enhance the argument for a Northern Ireland Agriculture Bill? 
Has any consideration been given to the potential impacts of regulatory divergence between GB and the EU, particularly with regards to the provisions within the Bill? Because Northern Ireland could be particularly vulnerable here, particularly in scope of Annex 2 of the protocol potentially being expanded. And what concerns does DARA have in relation to uh, its ability to influence, and the Executive as well, to influence any potential changes to Annex 2 of the protocol? In terms of could a Northern Ireland Agriculture Bill be brought forward? I don't want to go into great detail here, but looking at what we have in relation to Scotland and to Wales, there would seem to be potential. Um, that's something we're supposed to think about, as I say, in pages 37, 38, I've set out some of the things that, that are going on. Um, the idea, I think, to in relation to the Welsh schedule, Schedule 5, which includes a, a sunset clause within the existing bill, is that something that we could potentially explore here? That the uh, provisions would only apply until such times as we develop our own bill? That is, as I say, the approach that's being taken in Wales. Um, Again, and maybe in the context of the fact that the protocol only applies here, is that again an argument for why we might want to look at and consider a Northern Ireland specific bill, given that the impacts here are going to be different to the rest of the UK? Are there potential opportunities to extend some powers on the bill to Northern Ireland? The ones that I uh, was going to mention very quickly, the land tenancy issue. Um, those of you who would have been here back in October 2016, we may well remember the expert working group on the sustainable land management. They looked at a, they published a report, uh, Delivering Our Future, Valuing Our Soils, uh, and that actually included a, a very astute observation in relation to our tenancy um, arrangements at this point. At that point in time, 28.5% of Northern Ireland's agricultural land was rented with the vast amount let on con acre. For those of you, again, who don't know, it's roughly um, a short-term seasonal basis tenancy of 11 months or less. At that group at that time had recommended that the insecurity created by that system was uh, presenting challenges uh, in terms of competitiveness, competitiveness and environmental performance of agriculture here. So is there scope potentially to revisit that either within amendments to the existing bill or again is that something that a Northern Ireland bill could maybe potentially look up? Notable emissions in the bill, and I'm nearly finished here, so apologies. Uh, i tried to cover, and I realise there's a lot of ground in this. Um, there are areas which don't feature in the bill, which the first one I'll touch upon is interesting, given um, particularly some of the rhetoric that has been around last summer. Um, genetically modified organisms. Um, organic produce is in here. There's no mention of GMOs. Um, that's interesting in itself. Could be an unexpected oversight, you could argue, given the fact that the, the Prime Minister um, has previously voiced his support for, for GM crops and the UK, uh, UK's biotechnology sector, and apparently viewed the, the UK's leaving the EU as an opportunity for growth in this area. Uh, and indeed, the, the Conservative Party manifesto for 2019 general election did include a commitment to lead the world in the quality of our food. And the critical bit here is agriculture and land management driven by science led evidence-based policy, and some have interpreted that as an indication that uh, a GM uh, O policy may be uh, less precautionary than it would have been on within the, the EU. The difficulty, again, for us in relation to that, given that the EU approach is precautionary, Annex 2 of the protocol, again, contains numerous references to GM and GMOs. So in an event of regulatory divergence, where would we find ourselves if GB did effectively Loosen the, the bonds, and Northern Ireland find itself having to adhere to a more strict and rigid regime. And the final one, just in relation to, is, is migrant labour. It's not mentioned here. It's a Home Office uh, responsibility, so you could argue it shouldn't be in the bill. However, uh, the absence of any provisions within the bill could be an oversight, um, particularly as there is work going on. For example, you may be aware within DEFRA, DEFRA have been actively engaged in sponsoring a, a seasonal workers' pilot. So could there even have been provisions included there, for example, to enable the support or regulation to be brought forward to support schemes in support of industry? <coughs> and indeed, yesterday's announcement, uh, I suppose, puts us in fairly stark relief in relation to, to the focus going forward being on skilled labour. And as I said the earlier, reliance on our food processors on labour and the question being whether that labour is skilled or unskilled. 
Realise covered a lot of ground in that. Um, <coughs> apologies for that, but I'm happy to try and take any questions. But as I say, I'm probably not going to be able to provide you with answers. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that very uh, comprehensive uh, briefing and indeed for the compilation of the briefing paper as well. It's very, very helpful. Um, I suppose I'll move straight to members. John, you've indicated you want to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, Chairperson, there's so much in this, Mark, that it's difficult to know where, where to focus, but my immediate thoughts comes to something that you mentioned very early in your, uh, and that is the potential for the rise in the cost of food. And given that 40% of our people in Northern Ireland have already experienced um, in poverty. Uh, this seems to me a, an issue uh, which will impact on the most vulnerable people. And, you know, I can think of people who are mobile and all that mm. will do what happened a few years ago, went over the border for the cheap fuel, uh, will now be going over the border for the cheap food. And I certainly uh, wouldn't want to see that. Uh, uh, I have no problem with uh, imports, exports, but the people who can least afford it won't be able to do it. And it seems, Mark, that to comply with World Trade Organization rules, as a regional parliament, we have virtually no say in, 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 um, in what happens. And I get the impression that whoever drafted this bill has never been to Northern Ireland. Where, well, but for obvious reasons, where our agriculture is so fundamentally different and so highly dependent on smaller farmers, and with golden opportunities to expand our exports, uh, develop our organic uh, growth, and all those things. But it seems, uh, according to your uh, presentation, there's virtually no no cover for that at all. I think, I think it, it's difficult for me to, suppose, to say that at this time. I think, obviously, a lot of this will be subject to negotiation. Um, I think in relation to your, your WTO points, John, I think the, the Welsh and the Scottish response, I suppose, highlight their concerns. Mm -hmm. um, the Welsh approach was interesting, I suppose, and it, it, the MOU almost committed the government to talking. But as to whether that would actually... You're right in what you say. The government can effectively, in that regard, choose to do what it wants. Mm -hmm. I think it may be useful maybe to... Um, and I'm sure the department will be able to bring you up to speed in terms of what level of flexibility we will have there. Um, yes. How tough or what significant impact will the, the government have in relation to how restrictive will it be and what we can do? That, I have to say, is above my pay grade. Um, but I think the added complexity I want to convey in the paper was that it's not just the WTO AOA, it's also the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah. So I think we have an added complexity there, and I, I'm not quite clear as to how we, um, those two will interact. I think that's a critical question. I agree with you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Uh, for, uh, there's a lot to consume, absolutely, in, in your briefing. Um, there's a, quite a number of issues, of course, and I think migrant labour, in my area, for instance, there's 5,000 acres of apple orchards. They're totally dependent on migrant labour for the harvest each year, which is probably only an eight-week period, but it's vital that they have them or they wouldn't be able to harvest their crops. So. That's going to be an issue, but that issue is out of our hands probably too, isn't that right? Yes, well, it's, 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 a, it's a Home Office responsibility, but I, I put in the question there almost in terms of given the fact that, as I said, there is, there's the DEF are actively engaged in, the minute in a pilot scheme, which would actually, in relation to what you're talking about, William, it's a seasonal pilot scheme, yeah. which would cover the likes of, of fruit picking uh, and the likes of the Armagh Orchards. West Surely a bill could have explored some provisions, or, or uh, is it something, even as they say, if we have brought forward Northern Ireland bill, is it something we could look at even to give a minister powers to develop a pilot, potentially? Um, now, obviously, that was done, the sponsoring department is deferred, but it had to be done in con conjunction with the Home Office, who so have the responsibility for, for migration. But I, I think just looking at how reliant particular food processors, pro food processors are, I think it's, it's a pertinent point um, to raise in the sense of, could, could any provisions be included? If so, what's the best way to do it? Because, I mean, it, it was interesting even the way home radio last night was listening to um, an SMP, MSP, uh, talking about uh, the Scots actually looking for migration to be devolved and the idea of a Scottish visa. Now, that may well get short shrift, but the idea that they want, because they're in a similar situation to us, 
fish processing and other industries which rely heavily on migrant labour. Yeah. They seem to be seeking to try and secure a Scottish visa, which they would administer, which would restrict migrants from working in the rest of the UK, but would mean that they could continue to draw upon unskilled labour. Now, whether that's for a, a protracted basis or whether that's for a transitional period, I suppose the difficulty with the migrant labour one is if, if that was switched off overnight, the impact would be catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and that, that is going to be an issue. I know, I know that in the apple industry, you know, the growers are concerned at this stage, you know, but I'm an optimist. I usually feel that there's a way around this, and hopefully it'll work out. In relation to sustainable land use, Mr Chairman, okay, yeah. uh, and uh, I have some sympathies with this, from can declare an interest, but uh, Conacher is not... You know, if you go to all areas of the mainland in England, you know, there's more tenancies and long-term leases mm -hmm. and all the rest. Can occur. Eight or nine or ten month period, you can't plan ahead. You can't no. improve the land. The land improvements are not made because you're only there for a few months and could be away again. But uh, in relation to this, do you not think the only way around, or one of the only ways around this is there needs to be some sort of encouragement from Treasury to the landlords to do that because if there's no encouragement to do that, it's, it's not going to happen. No, and that, and that was touched upon in that report, um, as you will remember, 2016. Um, it's in there, I suppose, because I included it simply because the, the English sections, they, you know, their, their tenancy issues, you say, are significantly different. But the bill takes the opportunity to look at those and what could be done. And I suppose, again, I suppose I flagged it simply as I looked at it, I thought, well, why don't we have something similar? Why does not apply? Or it could be even within our schedule. Could there not have been some provision to enable us even to, to instigate a, even an assessment of what's possible and what isn't? Yeah. Okay. And it, it, equally, I have to say that is it may well be within the, the Minister's purview or remit to maybe bring forward a review. I'm simply looking at it as I see it on the face of the bill today. Yeah. Um, but I think it is an issue for us going forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that clear? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Mark. It's a, it's a real useful summation of the bill and it's really hard to find any questions that you have not already identified to be honest thank you um but i suppose i maybe want to ask you if you're aware or do you know what type of because you mentioned at the start about you know it's hard to see where northern ireland gets its voice heard mm. with this um what kind of engagement has the department or the sector had with the uk government while this was ongoing and also what kind of um, engagement they've had with each other, sort of the department and the sector here, have they produced a vision or documents of what they think would be good for Northern Ireland? I think that it, in that regard, um, and I think that the department has been clever in the sense of the, the flexibility that's given in Schedule 6, uh, and I suppose the department had conducted its own consultation in terms of the future shape of agricultural strategy here, Claire. Um, I suppose I don't want to speak for them, I suppose they're better place to know where, and even for the Minister, I suppose that was done without a Minister, so I suppose the Minister will ultimately have to set a direction of travel. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that direct payments are still on our schedule, or are still within our, our provision or our purview is, is significant, um, because the other parts of the UK, I suppose beyond transition, don't appear to have that, that opportunity, it's moving to a different system. Uh, we're effectively as we are at this point, but that could change. Um, in terms of what the industry thinks, again, I, I suppose you're, you're hearing from stakeholders later. Yeah. I'm not going to um, pre-guess what, what engagement they have because I'm not, I'm not actually aware in terms of I didn't look at it. I mean, from time to time I've, I've dipped in and stuff has been available in the press. But in terms of impact that those stakeholders had in development either of the schedule or even in terms of the Northern Ireland or Ireland Protocol, those are questions I suppose I don't know the answer to, but I, but I think they're good questions and if, if I was sitting with you, I would probably be asking those this afternoon as well because I think that's the critical point um, as to how this will actually operate in practice. Just one other thing then, and obviously there's notable emissions within that. You've identified mm. GMOs. Um, I would identify um, our climate targets and how this bill um, wants to achieve the already set targets that we have done and obviously for agriculture in Northern Ireland in particular is a huge carbon emitter. Um, is there anything in there that you feel does go there or is it just again right um, when they're just admitted? I suppose I, it, it's an omission I suppose what I would say is in terms of some of the, the, the commitments within the protocol potentially might 
But I, I suppose the, what I'm also saying, uh, I, was, I was writing this sitting opposite a colleague who's writing the paper for the Environment Bill for next week. Yeah. And she and I, I suppose, talk fairly regularly on it. And I know okay. that those are issues I think that, that she may well touch upon there. I suppose it's, you're not looking almost at these in isolation. They're coming as three separate LCMs, but they're, they're wholly complementary. Um, and there are areas where the, the interface, and I think yeah. you're correct what you say, it is, a, it is an omission. And I, I didn't cover it. But, um, yeah, I think you're, you're right to ask that question. Um, apologies for not flagging that one, but it's a... No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Rodney? Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for your uh, presentation. Uh, my my question is about fertilisers. As you know, we're a pasture-based uh, mm -hmm. agriculture, or depending on pasture-based um, agricultural industry here. Um, it's in relation to the regulatory divergence between the EU and GB. Mm -hmm. We're going to be left that we're going to have to manufacture a special fertiliser here for use in Northern Ireland. That's a good question. It's not one I've the answer to, but I think in a, in a, a theoretically, if you have regulator divergence and uh, adherence to the Northern Ireland Protocol would forbid the marketing and sale of fertilisers that didn't meet an EU standard. Mm. And that's not to say there could be a way, for example, where a GB manufacturer could manufacture a fertiliser for Northern Ireland that met those requirements. But I suppose you, you would have to ask the question, and that's the reason I put it in the papers, where do we currently source our fertiliser? Mm. Um, as you would know, the productive capacity in the island of Ireland, it's not there. Yeah. So we're going to be having to bring it from somewhere. So where does it come from? If we can only bring it from one place, does that affect competitiveness in the market? And does that have a knock-on impact on uh, the price of production and ultimately the price of food? So those are, that's a question above my pay grade again, but I think when I read it, that was the question that came to mind. And I think it is, you're right to flag, I think regulatory divergence is a common theme across all of this. And I think it's quite hard to know at this point what the, the, the final situation will be there. But I think that does present a risk to us particularly for East West movement. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mark, that's um, 4.1, Clause 17, mm -hmm. Food Security. There, there's also no indication of additional resources, mm -hmm. either national or devolved level, to address any identified issues. I suppose I mean, my concern would be, will you be able to manage? I mean, can we do it with the budget at all? I think that's it's a, it's a good question, and I suppose the, the duty um, to report and to lay a report before Parliament, as you say, that, that's very limited. So if, if the first report that's commissioned discovers there's a major issue, um, how will the government respond? I don't know. Um, if they'd found, for example, a major issue in terms of the, the cost of, of living or the cost of food a year, would that trigger Treasury to release funds to Northern Ireland? Those are questions I suppose you need to, you need to think about. Um, that's the reason I suppose I put them in there in the sense that I think it's, it's an admirable um, it's an admirable motivation to try and establish the situation pertaining to food security across a range of areas. But I suppose finding out what the situation is whilst not committing to action is maybe a certain degree, maybe a dereliction. Um, but you're right to say that there could be significant impacts financially if there were major issues discovered. And again, we are in a bit of a, a vulnerable position, uh, given our, our status, that we're sort of this halfway house in some ways, um, where our costs could be higher. And our supply chains uh, might actually, their resilience may be tested in a more significant way than maybe other parts of the UK. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, John, there. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Chair. Mark, can I add my thanks to, to those already expressed for the uh, very detailed report? Um, on a more broad question, uh, how do we ensure in our dealings with the department that in the context of balancing east-west with north-south, mm. in terms of whether, whether it's sales, movement of goods, movement of animals, uh, how do we be, as a committee best ensure <clears throat> that the balance is correct? As, as the protocol and uh, <coughs> excuse me, also regulations mm -hmm. develop? <laughs> I, don't, 
don't know. I know yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation. It's a, it's a difficult one to, to answer definitely, John, but I think you're right to, to identify those two directions of travel are the critical <coughs> ones. But it's the GB market, I suppose I made the point in the preamble, um, is the most significant <coughs> in terms of movement. So that, that west to, to east movement and Thank return, you, um, as we even touched upon in relation to issues like fertilisers, is critical. But equally, the, the state aid rules, as they pertain to, as I mentioned, the, the movement of, of goods from Northern Ireland into the EU, what will that mean? I mean, those are, those are areas, again, that uh, I've yet to read anything, and I've been trying to find stuff in terms that can give definitive assessments. This is still very much a, a process. The protocol is still very much being worked through. And indeed, there are some who have read it who question, is it workable? There are some who have major questions around um, how it will actually be able to be operated before the end of the year. That's, again, beyond my ability to assess. But I think it is, as we get down to the nub of making this work, both on a north-south, east-west basis, it's an added complexity um, that we are going to have to grapple with. And I think a critical question, and I, I, have, I have sympathy for the department, because the department, the fact is in the position of trying to, to make this operate, um, and there are, I think, legitimate questions there, Ryan, in relation from a, a UK uh, point of view in terms of resources and skills and support to enable that to be done. Uh, because there's a lot to try and deal with here. And, and it is where it interfaces. I mentioned the, the, where, does, where does the WTO sit in relation to the, the protocol, that requirement. There's just one example. Um, how do we benefit from future trade deals? Can we benefit from future trade deals? I have read one paragraph within the protocol which would actually suggest to me that the first half would say that Northern Ireland can benefit from UK trade deals. The second line in that paragraph suggests that we can't because we have to adhere to the protocol. So it's not at this point in time easy to make an assessment of, but I think that's, if I was looking at a direction of travel in terms of our own work stream and, and research even, that's something we're trying to look at but it, it's being done within the basis there's not a lot of information out there. That's maybe not an answer, but it's, no, it's trying a, to... it's a, an evolving conversation, really. I think it has to be, and I think you're right to flag it. Well, probably also, Chair, in relation to whether or not a Northern Ireland bill is desirable or required. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, the reason I flagged it in terms of... is I think we are in a particular unique circumstance. And whilst I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not advocating a bill or not a bill, I'm saying that yeah. I could see you could provide a rationale for a bill with the basis of the fact to try and take account of the particular circumstances we're going to face. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, Morris, the last one. Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Apologies for being late, Chair. Constituency matter to deal with. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for your presentation, most of which I heard. Uh, Mine is really a, a question. During the negotiations between the EU and the UK uh, over the protocol itself, Northern Ireland will be taken care of. But what happens after that? When the EU change the rules, change criteria, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where's our voice? I think that that is um, <laughs> that is a, a very good question um, in terms of how and when we can feed in to the process is a, is a is a critical question. It's not one that has any clarity around. Um, I think even the operation of the the joint committee, um, there is no detail on. Uh, it has to be worked up. To be fair to officials, this came together quite late last year. Um, I think the focus is on trying to determine how it will operate. But I think from where I'm sitting, a critical question is where would a Northern Ireland voice be heard? And secondly, will a Northern Ireland voice be listened to? Correct. Could I add just one please, yeah, no uh, And In terms of EU standards, we hear a lot about EU standards, but especially in food products, would the EU standards be as stringent as the UK standards, or would they be less stringent? We, we seem to be bigging up EU standards when actually perhaps the U, e, uh, UK standards are actually higher. I think that's, that's a valid uh, question, Morris, in relation to what, what directions does regulatory divergence take? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not, uh, most people again fixate on the fact that GB standards will drop and EU standards remain high. It could go the other way. I think that the issue for us in Northern Ireland isn't. Um, which direction it goes, it's the issue is divergence. Because divergence is the bit that causes the trouble. Because if we were trying to market the same product within two different territories, and if we had one arm tied behind our back about what we could actually do, it makes it quite difficult um, if you're uh, trying to grow an industry either in terms of production or export. So I think those are, 
it is that central theme of regulatory divergence and what it actually means. And to be honest, we probably won't have a, a greater idea of that in terms of until towards the end of the year to be see where is the UK, EU, is there going to be a trade deal? Is there going to be a level playing field? Or are we heading for a no-deal Brexit? When each day brings different, I suppose, um, opinions. Yep. Uh, and I don't know the answers to them, but all I know is that I think regulatory divergence is a critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that um, very um, detailed and insightful presentation and for taking the questions. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, move on now uh, very um, swiftly. Uh, we're going to receive um, oral evidence, uh, page 6 of 21 uh, on your pack on the Government Bill. Um, uh, if you six to twenty one your pack, you'll find evidence submitted by the department to the Westminster Bill Committee and a hundred transcript of the oral evidence uh, provided in the eleventh Committee. Also in the pack is a briefing paper on pages fifty eight to sixty two. The clauses of the UK Government Bill which apply to the here at pages sixty four and sixty five. The UK Culture Bill is page sixty six to one five nine X twenty note and hundred and sixty. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Norman uh, Fulton, Deputy Secretary, Rosemary, uh, Agni, Grade 5, Director of Brexit, Mark McLean, Principal Agriculture Economist, Capital Farm, and uh, you're very welcome uh, before, before the committee here um, this morning. And uh, I'd like you to maybe to, um, brief the committee, and then there'll be an uh, opportunity for members to ask some questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, so, I uh, just want to take a few moments to highlight key elements of the bill uh, and the underpinning uh, rationale. So, the main body of the bill is intended primarily to provide uh, the legal basis for the future agricultural policy direction for England, uh, and it reflects the ideas that were shared with stakeholders uh, a couple of years ago uh, in the Health and Harmony document from DEFRA. There are also elements within the main body of the bill that have a, a UK-wide reach uh, as they relate to reserve matters, and I'll come back to those in a few moments. Uh, so legislative consent is not being sought for either of these two components, uh, matters that are England only or UK-wide reserve matters. There are four remaining elements within the main body of the bill uh, that are UK-wide uh, in their remit, but uh, uh, they cover devolved matters. And again, I'll come back to these, and uh, these are matters for which we will be seeking uh, legislative consent. But our primary interest in this bill relates to the Schedule 6, the Northern Ireland Schedule, uh, and this has three main objectives. First of all, it's to provide uh, in domestic legislation <coughs> the legal basis for uh, the full suite of CAP Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 options that we had prior to EU exit. So without this, we would not have uh, the basis to con continue uh, direct support for farmers after this calendar year, nor would we have the option of continuing to make new commitments uh, under Pillar 2 schemes, either current or modified. So we need to have those powers in place, uh, and that's what Schedule 6 will do. Secondly, uh, the Schedule will enable us to modify, to simplify, uh, to correct the framework that we're carrying forward out of the old cap. So it provides that additional flexibility. And thirdly, it will give us uh, certain uh, keeping pace powers to enable us to ensure that we can respond to changes that might be brought forward elsewhere in the UK that could cause difficulties if we didn't have the option, and it is an option, of making similar changes uh, to Northern Ireland. So it's important to understand exactly what we're seeking to achieve here. Uh, so Schedule 6 is therefore not designed to set a new policy agenda. That is not the purpose of Schedule 6. It is designed to provide certainty, stability, whilst we develop our new policy framework uh, moving forward. It's to provide a degree of flexibility in the implementation of rolled over regime uh, that we will be carrying forward, and to provide the ability to keep pace with changes uh, needed to ensure the functioning uh, of the UK internal market. Now, the drafting of this uh, was carried out in the absence of an executive and an assembly, um, but it was developed very specifically so as not to prejudice or constrain the ability of an incoming minister, executive or assembly to decide long-term direction. 
uh, and nature of agricultural support policy in Northern Ireland, and this is a very important point as well. We didn't set out to create a new policy agenda. Uh, we were trying to ensure that we maintained stability, maintained a bit of flexibility, uh, and maintained the ability to, to keep pace where we needed to keep pace, and it was no more than that. Uh, so this is an important point. This is not setting out our long-term policy vision. So turning briefly to the specific uh, provisions in the schedule, uh, you'll, you'll see that the, these relate to maintenance uh, and modification of uh, cap, carried over cap direct payment schemes, uh, the modification of uh, retained EU law relating to financing, management and monitoring uh, of payments, so the, the technical aspects. Uh, providing ongoing ability for ongoing support for rural development, uh, provides for the collection and sharing of data and appropriate data protection, provides for intervention in agricultural markets where necessary, and for setting of standards and, and carcass classifications. And the use of the, the majority of these uh, Northland provisions are subject to uh, the affirmative resolution procedure. So therefore, their use is entirely a matter for the Minister and the Assembly. Um, so, uh, in addition, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a small number of UKY provisions which, in part, deal with devolved matters, um, and uh, these are in relation to um, the Secretary of State's duty to report to Parliament on food security, as you've heard. National security is a reserved matter, uh, and food is one of 13 uh, UK critical national infrastructure sectors. However, uh, within that, um, and within this particular uh, issue, food and drink supply is a devolved matter, as is the analysis of statistical data that falls to DERA. Uh, identification and traceability uh, of animals, clause 32. Uh, uh, regulation of uh, fertiliser products, uh, clause 31. And regulation of organic products, uh, clauses 36, 37. Um, all devolved uh, matters. Just maybe mention in respect of uh, the uh, identification and traceability of animals and regulation of organic products, uh, we are seeking, we're still in discussion with DEFRA, but we are seeking al alterations here so that any regulations that may be made uh, under these uh, clauses by the DEFRA <coughs> Secretary of State can only be made uh, with the express consent of Northern Ireland. Um, so we're seeking that additional uh, element to be inserted. So the process of securing leg legislative consent uh, will be initiated for those part of the, uh, the bill that extend to Northern Ireland uh, and that fall within the competence uh, of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and we plan to lay the legislative consent uh, memorandum shortly. And finally, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the UK-wide provisions that do not require legislative consent, um, uh, as these are reserved matters but extend across into Northern Ireland, are in relation to uh, fair dealing uh, with agricultural producers, clause 27, uh, producer organisation, clauses 28 to 30, and WTO agreement on agriculture, 40 to 42. Chairman, that's a, a very brief uh, overview. Uh, hopefully it, it supplements, complements what uh, you've heard earlier, uh, and very happy to take uh, questions from the committee. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Norman. Um, you've received a lot of information indeed from the previous um, person address committee, Mark, and indeed from yourselves as well, and I'm sure members have plenty of questions to ask. But I suppose um, I want to just raise the issue of migrant labour because it's something that's quite um, topical in light of the announcement from the British Home Office uh, just, just yesterday. I want to pursue a points-based uh, immigration system. Um, some of the information we provided from Queen's University uh, just in the today's table papers, actually, and from last week, that there's around 100,000 employed, there's 22,000 employed people employed in food and drink industry, 78,000 employed in farming and associate support um, services, and um, supported and rely heavily reliant on uh, American workers coming here. Um, so, w what's your assessment of that um, announcement from the Home Office? And will the department be making a very robust representation to the Home Office, given the reliance on people from outside this country uh, working? For example, I understand there's over 10,000 people employed from outside this country um, in the food processing, for example. 
and obviously, obviously the uh, reliance for seasonal workers. Um, indeed, um, I heard on the radio this morning representatives from the EFU talking about the Bramley apples and how, for example, it's harvest time that American workers are needed uh, as part of the industry. So, well, has the department made any assessment of that, and are there plans to make robust re representation to Home Office in relation to this? Yeah, I mean, this is an issue of uh, significant concern uh, to the department. Uh, we did a survey published it last year um, on the importance of migrant labour within agri-food. I think the overall figure was about 40% uh, of uh, workers within uh, the, the agri-food processing sector uh, are migrant labour. Uh, obviously, that varies by sector, subsector. Um, and also by individual businesses, some businesses much more heavily, heavily reliant on migrant labour, labour than others. So it's a, it's a hugely important uh, issue uh, for us. Uh, it's not a case of will we make robust representations. We have been very closely uh, engaged uh, with um, with Whitehall uh, on this, making representations, working with stakeholders who have also been working, making representations, working with the Department of Economy uh, as well, uh, who obviously have a, a clear interest in, in this matter as well, uh, working with the Migration Advisory Committee. So we've had uh, numerous representations um, and expressed our concerns uh, to make sure that the Mig migration policy of the UK, which is a reserved matter, uh, actually meets our needs. But what we now have within the statement that was made yesterday was a very clear statement that there will be no regional variation uh, on the policy. Um, and also there's no provision, specific provision, for low-skilled workers within the policy. So that's very disappointing uh, and uh, it is very concerning uh, for the industry here. Okay. And you know, I, I do also think and share and some of the commentary around this that it actually is insulting to refer to as many of these people as unskilled or whatever because their skills are very much valued for the industry here. Absolutely essential um, for the industry. Just before I pass through, I want to just ask uh, another question. It's just in relation to the, um, the WTO issue that was raised uh, at, the, at the last Try and find it my pack here. The WTO issue was raised during the last presentation, Norman. Yeah, um, yeah. Clauses 40 to 42 within the Agriculture Bill. Um, what would be the department's position in relation to um, the, the UK maintaining compliance with the WTO and what's the implications for here? Yeah, um, this is an issue on which uh, we don't have particular concerns. Um, it's, it's more a probably a political issue than anything else uh, in relation to the positions adopted by uh, Scotland and Wales. Um, so the UK has, will have, does have now obligations under WTO to report uh, in terms of the nature of uh, support within agriculture um, and, and that needs to be done uh, and any new measures coming forward uh, under agriculture will have to be uh, classified in terms of where they fall within uh, WTO classifications. So UK uh, will inherit around about, I think it's 5.9 5 .9 billion, uh, euro. billion euros worth of uh, amber box headroom, if you like, which is well in excess of any budget uh, that the UK would ever spend on agriculture. And this is amber box, the most trade distorting element uh, within, within uh, WTO classification. There's no limit under WTO on blue box support and there's no limit on WTO on green box support. So therefore, in effect, there is virtually no circumstance we can think of where WTO will limit our policy room for manoeuvre. And therefore, um, this is not an, an issue that we are overly concerned about. Now, where we do have, um, I suppose, uh, certain constraints in terms of the nature of uh, agricultural support arises out of the Northern Ireland Protocol, that's an entirely separate uh, matter. Uh, so on, on the WTO issues, uh, I say it's, it's probably more a political matter uh, rather than a practical matter uh, as, as far as we're concerned. Thank you for that, Norman. I'm going to move swiftly around the members here. I might want to come back in again in a few hour bits, but I'll move around the members here. Claire, you're next on the list. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. Good to see you again. I maybe want to come back to 
what I was asking before, you probably heard as well. So Schedule 6, you're very clearly stating, obviously, it is not a policy direction. It is about maintaining the status quo. I imagine that's because we had no government at Correct. the time to, to do that. Um, but in that absence, while those discussions were going on, while this work was being done, were the department, yourselves and the sector coming up with your own vision or plan or discussions about what you would like to see happen? Yeah, um, and uh, it was in August 2018 that we published uh, a discussion document okay. uh, on a, a potential future agricultural framework. Um, and that was co-designed uh, with, with uh, environment, uh, food and agriculture stakeholders in the room. Um, and uh, the, the main pillars, the four main pillars within that framework would be productivity, resilience, um, environmental sustainability and supply chain functionality. Um, and so that was, um, and so we had, a, I think, about 1,200 responses uh, to that engagement exercise. Um, so, uh, and to a significant degree, very uh, supportive of that broad framework. Obviously, now moving forward, we need to flesh that out. Uh, but it was probably as much as we could do uh, in the absence of uh, the devolved administrations. But at least it started the conversation, uh, and we can move forward from there. And could something, that, that discussion paper that you have produced, could it be the very solid baseline for if we decided to come up with our own agriculture policy? Is that sitting there that wouldn't take too much longer to turn into a policy? Well, obviously now we have a minister in place, yeah. uh, and uh, the minister will obviously want to take time to consider that, to see yeah. is, that, is that the direction is uh, that being done? That he wants to go, yes, uh, and we'll, we'll move forward f from there. Um, and I think that then, um, I suppose over the next, probably over the next year, uh, we'll start then to flesh out what the, the longer term direction of agricultural policy would be, how it integrates obviously with the environmental agenda, uh, very important uh, as, as well. And it may well be from that that evolves then uh, our own uh, primary legislation uh, that we may want to bring forward. Um, obviously, timing isn't slightly awkward uh, in that you've got uh, two years left within this mandate. Um, so therefore, it probably will split across uh, the mandate uh, just because of the timing of it. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we can now move forward. Um, in the meantime, it's important that we do have this uh, legislation in place, in place to provide for continued support uh, to agriculture and under rural development as well. Okay. It, it buys us breathing space. Okay, thank you. Um, Claire, uh, moving right now to Rosemary. Thanks. Uh, my question is about traceability. Um, you, said in traceabil you said with relation to traceability that you were seeking alterations. Now, would that um, include the entry of the NIFAS data into yep. the UK uh, LIS system? Yeah, so what, what the bill provides for is the possibility of a, an overall UK uh, framework um, and also provides for some, uh, for England, the ability to yep. basically uh, disapply the current uh, approach to animal uh, identification. Um, and currently that uh, framework, uh, as framed at the minute, uh, could extend across Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales. Uh, what we're asking is, if it were to be extended to Northern Ireland, that would only be done with our express consent. Uh, and therefore we are happy that uh, we could actually feed into uh, that overall livestock um, information system. But in doing so, before we would obviously provide any consent to that, we want to be assured uh, that it works for us. Um, the independence that we have around the AFIS system, which works, uh, is that it has also been a very important marketing tool uh, for our industry here uh, around the traceability, uh, safety, provenance uh, of uh, our, our um, red meat sector. Um, and having that flexibility has uh, been extremely important. Um, obviously, we wouldn't want to lose that uh, within an overall UK framework. Uh, but these are the types of things that could be considered uh, before uh, necessarily signing up to a, a UK-wide uh, information system. And I believe that Scotland and Wales probably will uh, have similar views on this one as well. Um, so the concept 
we can see the logic of the concept of having a single system for the UK, but we need just to be assured um, that before we would sign up, uh, it actually works for us. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, that would be the, the slight adjustment uh, that we, we would ask for. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the and um, can you see the perhaps um, issues concern maybe in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol? Yeah, under protocol, we will be required to maintain uh, the um, the animal identification system, um, and and therefore we will have to yes maintain uh, that alignment with EU systems. Uh, so England, for example, could change uh, what they want to do. Uh, they've taken that option within the bill. Um, what Scotland or, or Wales might decide uh, is is separate again, uh, but. Clearly, uh, under protocol, we have to main, maintain alignment uh, with the EU uh, on animal identification. Okay, thank you. Um, and just, um, uh, just on the back of what Rosemary said there, I do I want to just add the importance of traceability, not just within this bill, but also in terms of accessing international markets as well. Yeah. And we um, we see the issues that have arisen with the implementation of the NAFIS. And we are getting a report on that, I believe, from the department, hopefully in the near future, in terms of uh, where all that's at. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, F Philip? Yep, thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, just on, on the point that you raised about uh, the migrant workforce, I mean, you clearly identified the concern uh, that, that we have here and that the, the industry has and that uh, the business community has. And essentially, what you're saying is that. Westminster government has totally ignored those concerns, uh, even though it, it has clearly been identified as having a potential serious negative impact on all of those things. I mean, not that in the first instance, <coughs> it was very concerning. Uh, my question and points are uh, covering some of the stuff that Claire has already raised. Uh, uh, in terms of the conversation that maybe you've had with the minister about his views on whether we will be having our own uh, bill within the north and uh, the, the time constraints, because uh, I mean I was going to ask, does it have to happen within the two-year period or does it fall? But then, in, in your answer to Claire, you, you seem to indicate that there's potential that we could, if that was the, the direction of travel, start it and then resume it again uh, in the aftermath of uh, a new mandate? Is that, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, the, these are uh, some conversations we need to have uh, in terms of what's doable uh, within the timeline. Uh, and we have to obviously build in a significant and uh, period of stakeholder engagement in all of this, because uh, this is setting our future direction and policy. Um, that we could be with us for you know the next 10, 15, 20 years. So we need to be assure, assured that everybody uh, has their say, uh, is able to express their views uh, in all of this. Um, so you know we, we will not just jump straight into drafting a bill. Uh, we will have to make sure that we have that process uh, properly done, and that will take time uh, to do that. And whether we can do all of that and squeeze it in. Uh, before 2022, or whether we need to split it across that, that's a conversation we still have to have. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's important that we just don't stick with what will be an increasingly dated framework, which is the cap, because the rest of Europe will be moving on to the next iteration of cap. Um, so whilst we've taken flexibilities to adjust, amend, modify, it's still an old framework. Um, and it's not a framework that has been designed for Northern Ireland. Um, and what we want is a framework designed for us, that works for us. Um, and that's where we, we need to, to get to, uh, and then reflect that then in due course uh, within, within primary legislation taken through the Assembly here. Okay, Philip. Mm -hmm. um, I note that the Welsh Parliament are intending to lay a white paper by the end of the calendar year yep. for their future policy. Is that something that we have been made, we possibly remain to do here from the department's point of view? Well, I think Wales have had the benefit of uh, obviously an assembly uh, to, to work on this. Um, in, in the first version of the, the Agriculture Bill, uh, the Welsh uh, schedule quite closely resembled uh, the direction of um, English policy. Uh, 
uh, in terms of moving towards that uh, public money, public goods, uh, away from direct support. Um, they've now effectively uh, moved back to a position within the bill that is very similar to Northern Ireland uh, in terms of just rolling forward, but rather taking those, that more fundamental uh, shift back to a Welsh legislative process um, and take a bit more time uh, to actually look at the issues. Um, and, and yes, they, they do plan to bring a white paper forward by the end of the year. Uh, but I say they've, they've had the benefit of, uh, I suppose, that political direction. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, for us to catch up uh, would be challenging. Charles. Okay, that's good. Um, we have uh, John Blair. Thanks, Norman. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thanks, Norman, for the, the information so far. Um, you, you probably heard before you, before you came forward to the table my, my question uh, to <coughs> research basis about the north, south, east, west balance. And can, can I ask you just uh, about the department's thinking on that? and whether or not there's ministerial and departmental focus on ensuring that that balance is right and, and uh, up for change, as it were, as the regulatory processes and the level <coughs> and other the protocol, other, other factors evolve. Um, I'm asking that on the basis of, of course, north-south, whether it's food production or processing, and east-west in relation to trade. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I've asked already in the chamber about the environmental performance scheme which we've done under Pillar Two of CAP. Are we making progress on that? Um, and other additional factors such as the Rural Development Fund can, can that be developed still by the department, separate to or within the the work being done around the bill? And also, the chair might have touched on it there. The the ideas of memorandum of understanding with. GB government on this bill, has the department explored that? Okay, so quite a number of issues in there. Um, to give them prior and, 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 and <laughs> some, some of them are bill related, some are clearly uh, not, not bill related. Um, on uh, sort of, we'll start with north south, um, trade, um, etc. Um, <coughs> that, that is effectively now addressed by protocol. Uh, so we operate within the, the same regulatory uh, framework and customs framework as uh, uh, the South and, and the rest of Europe. Uh, and therefore, effectively, uh, the trading patterns uh, that you see at the minute uh, will not be disturbed uh, by uh, the, the protocol that preserves uh, that. Um, I suppose the migrant labour issue now introduces uh, a new element into that, in that West you will have a completely open um, environment, trading environment, or north-south. Uh, you may well have a restriction in labour availability uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, but you won't have that restriction in labour availability um, in Southern Ireland. And therefore, how does that feed through uh, into um, the structure uh, of, of processing uh, and how it moves forward? That's, that's, that's an open question, I suppose. Uh, on the east-west uh, side of things, again, that's a, effectively a protocol issue uh, rather than uh, uh, an agriculture bill issue. Um, although it does, there are some elements that, uh, that uh, cut across. Uh, but in one direction, uh, there's the UK government commit, uh, commitment to unfettered access. Um, so uh, that effectively is, is what uh, we will be expecting. Uh, from from UK government, um, and then from east to west, then it's uh, Northern Ireland uh, um, implementation of uh, European obligations uh, is, is what will effectively be the uh, the key issue there in terms of uh, the movement uh, of, of goods from east to west. Um, so I suppose uh, the one thing you can say is that things won't be the same. That's a fact uh, of, of Brexit, uh, but how precisely they will evolve, uh, we, we, we have to wait and see. Uh, but certainly things will change, that's, that's for sure. Um, pillar 2 progress uh, on EFS, uh, you mentioned that. So yes, uh, we, are, we are progressing that um, and, and uh, trying to move that on as, as quickly as possible and we'll make announcements on that uh, as quickly as we can. Um, RDP, um, 
Well, the bill here, uh, as, I, as I said, will enable us to, um, if, if we so desire, if the Minister so desires, uh, actually continue to make commitments uh, beyond this year. Uh, as it stands, the, the current rural development programme commitments cannot be made after 31st of December this year. That's the programme effectively complete as, as, as far as commitments are concerned. Obviously, there will be a, a rollout of those commitments, funding of um, commitments made that may be multi-annual uh, in, in nature, for example, like uh, agri-environment, like forestry, uh, or even where capital uh, measures the commitment is made this year, but the, the money doesn't actually um, flow until next year. Um, but with the modifications that we could make under the schedule, uh, we could then think about um, you know, rolling forward those existing schemes beyond this year for new commitments. So that's the flexibility that this would provide, um, or indeed modify uh, the schemes themselves. Um, uh, and an MOU uh, with the, 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 the Welsh model of a memorandum of understanding with the, the government of the Welsh yeah, I think the MOU uh, might have been specifically in relation to WTO. Uh, so there's a, there's a very specific issue, um, uh, and again, it's largely a political uh, issue uh, rather than a practical issue per se. Something we could look at, Chair. Chair, could I come back just to one of them with the rural development program? Um, I'm reading in to that that there, there aren't currently plans to definitely extend that, and there may not be an Therefore, be budgetary provision either for the first quarter of the next year, calendar year, last quarter financial year, um, after 31st of the 12th. And also, obviously, um, there aren't currently preparations uh, being made to build that into the 21 22 financial year. Okay, uh, so the bill is, is, is a framework, it's there to permit, to enable. Uh, so then there's the subsequent uh, decisions to be made, you know, do we make use of those powers? Uh, so that's what the bill is there to do, it's to create that enabling framework. Um, so in terms of the, the you know, decisions on what we carry forward, uh, do we amend them, all of those decisions yet to come. But in terms of budgetary provision, um, so effectively on the run out of the existing REP, uh, that is covered. Uh, and the, uh, the European monies that were committed uh, to RT RDP will continue until 2023. That's the, the end uh, of that, that funding stream. Uh, and certainly in terms of the budgetary processes going forward, um, we have a, I think it's going to be a one-year budget this year and then a, a spending review, more fundamental spending review in the autumn, uh, I think is uh, probably the, the pattern. So within all of that, obviously, we'll be making uh, our bids uh, around budgetary uh, provision, um, and remember that covers not just um, rural development but also pillar one as well, uh, because this is all now national monies, and therefore that has to be built into the forward uh, budget period. Um, so yes, we have, for example, on, on agriculture support, uh, a manifesto commitment that actually needs now to be translated into a budgetary process. Uh, and we would expect that to be built into the spending of the process. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Norman. Um, we have John Dallas. Chairperson, thanks. Thanks, Norman, for your presentation. Uh, Norman, I'm sitting here trying to sort out the fantasy world from the real world, and it's increasingly difficult. And I refer in particular to page 63, bullet point, give or agree to give financial assistance to agriculture producers whose incomes are being or likely to be adversely affected by disturbance in agricultural markets. I would be extremely grateful if you could expand on that, explain what is meant by disturbance. And I have in mind what we spoke about earlier, the potential for a hike in the price of uh, retail uh, food here in Northern Ireland, where poverty is extremely prevalent. And uh, I'm also mindful that on Monday, the Minister, when I raised a question about ammonia and nitrates, told me I should use my influence with the Minister for uh, Finance. Now, I don't think I have much influence with the Minister for Finance, but the people may be listening to this 
for wanting to know what's in the future, wanting to know are they going to live in the real world or the fantasy world. Okay, so again, this is uh, an enabling uh, power uh, for the department. It's, yeah. It would enable the, the department to respond to uh, a market emergency. Uh, so if for some reason, um, I suppose in the past, examples of this would have been the BSE crisis. Yes. Where uh, overnight we lost all export markets. Or the ban, uh, the Chinese ban on pig product, perhaps. Is that one? Um, well, if it created, if, if, if a, a global uh, event created a local market crisis, this would enable us to take action mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and move quickly um, to actually put in place um, a measure uh, to actually support farmers' uh, incomes. So that's the purpose of this. It is an emergency response uh, capability. Um, and say Sorry, the BSE no, crisis is, is probably the one that, uh, you know. Is it like the ammonia and everything else? Is it dependent on and subject to availability of money? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's an enabling power. Um, it, it does not provide us with uh, yes. any funding cover. No, no. But we need the. I mean, it, get, it gets us to a point of can we do it? Yes, we could. Uh, but then we have to find the funding uh, to actually put it in place. But without the power, you know, you can't move at all. And could I just finally just ask about uh, clauses 27 to 30, fair dealing with agricultural producers and producer organisations? I uh, would certainly welcome that, and I would be grateful if you would expand a little on what exactly that means, because it seems something which we would be enormously interested in. Okay, so uh, that um, would be a reserve matter, um, but producer organisations, uh, effectively anything that deals with competition <coughs> is a reserve matter, um, and when it comes to producer organisations, effectively that cuts across competition policy, uh, because effectively you're saying to a group uh, of operators within the market, you can cooperate, effectively collude uh, together, uh, but what this does, it actually permits that. Um, uh, and therefore, producer organisations can't come together to actually then try and improve their position within the marketplace. Or, um, and it's not just about necessary market power per se, but actually cooperate. Um, and we've seen that, for example, with Northway mushrooms, in terms of what difference that has made uh, to the production of, of, of mushrooms within Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, Norman, coming together. Have you used the word cooperate a number of times? And I'm encouraged to believe that. You might be suggesting the setting up of cooperatives uh, where these people collectively would have a stronger voice. Am I right? Is that possible? Yep. So within this, it would allow the recognition of uh, former, formal producer organisations. I would welcome that. Um, William. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And thank uh, everyone on the team. Uh, in relation to private storage, uh, uh, and uh, private state aid uh, in that situation. Northern Ireland in the past has said available that we're a big exporter, so we'd be one of the first to be affected if there was an issue. Is that a devolved matter, or is that, is that down to the department to finance, or what's the story with that? Yep, uh, that would be a uh, devolved matter. Um, so, therefore, if we were to uh, have private storage aid, storage aid or even intervention purchasing, uh, effectively, that comes within devolved uh, agricultural um, powers uh, and responsibilities. And that uh, then, because that's a market measure, because you're actually yeah. stepping into a market, this is where we have effectively taken the power to keep pace with what's happening elsewhere uh, in GB. Uh, we wouldn't want to be left in a situation, for example, in a market, uh, a weak market where, for example, GB Scotland and Wales decided not to use those powers, yeah. we still had uh, intervention open. And effectively, you know, what you have then is product moving into Northern Ireland uh, from elsewhere and using our agricultural budget to support markets and to benefit farmers elsewhere in the UK. So we need to have the ability to adjust what we have in Northern Ireland with whatever's happening elsewhere uh, in, in GB. Um, and, and therefore, those keeping pace powers uh, are important for that internal UK market and to avoid distortions uh, emerging uh, within that internal market. The, the last time intervention was, be, was used a number of years back, 
Was that at that? It wasn't the full responsibility of Northern Ireland at that stage, sure. Oh, it's, it's, it's an, EU, an EU measure. Yeah, I thought the EU budget. Budget. So it would be a totally different ballgame if it was needed it's in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. In relation to cross compliance penalties and fines, well, the, is that outside Europe? Uh, do we set our own guidelines in relation to that? Yep. Uh, again, this is a fully devolved matter. Um, and it uh, fits within um, whatever policy framework we wish, wish to set. Uh, and that's well, I was, I was very critical of some of those measures in the past. Not, not that I don't believe there should be cross compliance, I absolutely do, but I think the, the issue of intentional and negligent, and the, in many cases, the punishment was much more than not fitting for the crime yeah. in my sight. So yeah. yeah. These are all issues that we can look at. Uh, and indeed, uh, we, we are actively looking at that. Well, welcome, that. Okay. Thank you, William. William had kind of touched on something that I was going to raise with you as well. G given the fact that we're dealing now with national monies as opposed to uh, we're out of the EU, um, in the past, you would have situations where farmers uh, who were applying for funding were, were penalised, maybe make a, a, a clerical error, by mistake, and they were grossly penalised. Uh, as a result of making a clerical error. And the department, right there along, were pointing to the fact that you're dealing with EU funds and subject to EU uh, regulations around all this here. Without prejudice, would there be greater scope for um, recognising those type of genuine errors now in terms of, say, making a mistake on the form or something like that there, uh, compared to what had been in the past where maybe the funding or the entire fund was delayed maybe by making a mistake of and certain a wrong field or taking a wrong box on an application for him. Yeah, uh, and again, that comes back to the issue. Agricultural <coughs> policy is, is fully devolved. Uh, it fully comes back uh, to, to, uh, to Northern Ireland, and the nature of the schemes, the controls, the monitoring, uh, all of those issues are within the design of uh, the policy and, and the schemes that come out of that policy. So what we have implemented up to this point in time, effectively, is, a, is an EU control regime, uh, and we now move beyond that. Um, and so it, it's, it's back to designing what's uh, proportionate and appropriate uh, for, for us. Uh, but at the end of the day, safeguarding uh, uh, taxpayer money. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Chair, just I would add to that that since 2016, the EU introduced the possibility of doing what they call preliminary checks, which actually we in the Department has done since 2016 and has picked a lot of those issues up and, you know, as enabled the department to write out to people at an early stage to say there's possible error here if you respond within a certain time. And, you know, that has been very successful in resolving a lot of the issues that you, you know, that you've raised there. Yeah. yeah. Even in, in the FA, I'm aware of a number of issues, not going individual issues, where their own box has been ticked and this has resulted in, in people uh, losing out to genuine mistakes, clerical errors. Claire? Thank you. I'm coming back. <laughs> Um, do you, is there, I'm thinking of, so if we're talking that there's the potential for a framework document there and it'll take obviously a few years to get this up and going, we're going to cross mandates with it, but what we've got is a schedule that maintains the status quo um, and yet we have international obligations, we have UK wide obligations in terms of in terms of climate, we know a lot of the pollution levels here as well. We know that the agri sector is a huge contributor to that in Northern Ireland. Where, where is the department in terms of looking at maintaining the status quo for the next set number of years? And how will we maybe contribute to missing our own targets on that one? And again, it comes down to those compliance issues because compliance is very, very weak in this schedule. They're, you know, in terms of accountability mechanisms. So in terms of our air pollution, our water pollutions, our rivers, the fish kills, um, a lot of, you know, I could go on, the list is, is long. How are we going to monitor, how are we going to be compliant and how are we going to not miss our targets? by maintaining the status quo. Okay, so uh, what, this, what, what Schedule 6 does, it, move, it carries forward effectively the architecture, yep. um, but it also gives us the ability to modify uh, and amend the architecture. Uh, and within that then, you, we can come forward, either we can decide to roll forward existing measures, existing schemes, or to modify uh, and change uh, the existing schemes, for example, in agri-environment. Uh, and that, that is there. Um, and 
the existing uh, rural development programme already does have a significant climate change uh, component to it. Um, that was one of the, the themes, the cross-cutting themes within the design uh, of, of the programme. So it's already there, but obviously it can be strengthened can, as we move forward. But uh, coming across then into the, the regulatory framework, that all is still in place. That doesn't change. Uh, so all of the EU regulatory framework effectively has now been brought back into UK uh, law um, and retained EU legislation. So that all is still in place. That hasn't changed uh, and is still there. So there's been no weakening uh, in, in that respect. Um, it still exists. Is that just for this calendar year? Or no, no, it's, it, no it, it is, it is, it is uh, brought back into retained, uh, retained law. Maybe meet you outside. <laughs> right, um, um, before you um, let you go, Norman and uh, Mark and Rosemary, um, I just want to ask the question as well, again, come back to finance, because funding and finance is a crucial uh, element. Uh, within, um, rural, within the rural community sector, there always has been um, probably a heavy reliance on the leader programme, uh, administered through the LAGs, uh, the, pri the Priority 6, former Access 3 of the Rural Development Programme. And this has been a mainstay for community-based organisations, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around capital projects and crashes and community halls and other projects such as that there. Um, and I know I'm aware of a lot of groups who I've been speaking to and I'm engaged with the community sector myself quite a bit, who are very nervous about what will follow this, uh, this Rural Development Programme. And, you know, they're conscious that in other parts of the EU, they're already uh, consulting and planning for the 2021 to 27 uh, Rural Development Programme. What, is, what will be the future here? Has the Department been making any uh, bids to the UK Prosperity Fund in terms of getting uh, programmes here for the community sector? Because this is a, a crucial piece of the social and economic um, fibre of our rural communities. Yeah, um, so you, you will be aware of the uh, the um, policy development work that is being carried out uh, on the Fiona McCandless side uh, of the department, uh, looking at the future of rural policy. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of work uh, on that so far, and it continues, and that effectively will set whatever the new policy framework and agenda will be going forward. Um, so that, that, that work continues uh, and continues apace. Um, the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, I mean, I don't know how developed it is at this stage. Um, it's not something that we're directly involved with, but I do know that, um, you know, a few months ago it was still quite unclear as to, you know, exactly what it would cover, uh, how it would operate, how it would be administered. It is a, a UK fund, uh, but exactly how that might translate into, you know, on-the-ground operation was not clear. Now, it may well have moved on from then. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not an area that uh, I'm directly involved with. Okay, um, we're um, Harry. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just a wee concern: 28.5 percent of Northern Ireland's agricultural land is rented. Mm -hmm. Going forward, uh, a bit concerned: the farmer that are renting the land still be able to make a profit with the new rise. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, I suppose a couple, couple of issues in there, um, and maybe just pick up a point around Conacre more generally. Um, and and <coughs> it was raised uh, in, in the earlier uh, presentation. Um, there is nothing uh, that prevents a movement towards longer-term lease within Northern Ireland. There's no, there's no bar uh, to that. Um, so it's largely uh, an issue around. Tradition, misinformation, um, and um, just a failure to move. Uh, so there's no, there's nothing there that actually would stop the, the industry moving towards longer term. Uh, at least now, if you're just trying to overcome inertia, it can be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, but there's, there's, there's no legislative problem there at all. Uh, this was issue going forward in terms of profitability of agriculture. Um, just back to the framework that we talked about earlier, um, an absolutely key element in there is to improve productivity. Um, and if you look at UK performance versus uh, other international comparators, UK has been falling behind. 
Um, and it's basically flatlined uh, since over the last 20, 20 years or so. If you don't keep up with productivity, uh, then you will struggle uh, in terms of profitability. Um, productivity generally reflects into reduced prices. That's, that's sort of a simple uh, law of economics, effectively. Uh, and therefore, if, you're not, if your productivity isn't keeping up with your competitors, you're going to be facing uh, reducing profitability. And therefore, that's where we need to make real gains. Uh, we need to catch up. We need to try and run faster. Uh, uh, than our competitors uh, to actually try and uh, close that gap uh, and, and move beyond that. But it also ties in very well uh, with the environmental agenda as well, because productivity is largely about resor res using resource efficiently. Uh, and if you're using resource efficiently, uh, you're cutting costs, but you're also cutting your environmental footprint. Uh, so there's a lot of interaction uh, and integration between that productivity and the resilience and the environmental performance uh, pillars uh, within the, uh, the, the framework we, we, we've talked about. So it's something that we do need to move forward on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. See, in terms of um, competition in uh, Norman, um, obviously we share a land border here with the, the south of Ireland, and you know, um, agriculture processing across the island is highly integrated, and dairy being a, a very good example where produce may cross the border five times before it's actually mm. finished. Um, would you see it important um, that in, term, in terms of managing our competitive, competitiveness here and keeping competitive, that we uh, track and keep up to speed with what levels of support that there is in the south of Ireland? You know, bearing in mind, where, for example, that they have a very well-funded ANC scheme and they've got um, sheep and beef and genomic various other schemes as well. Would, would you see it as important that in terms of um, managing our own competitiveness and to compete on a level playing field that we keep track with that? And yep. So I suppose there, there, there are I suppose two elements uh, in there. First of all, it's, it's actually having the funding uh, stream um, and absolutely that's important. Uh, and it's something that uh, we're very mindful of uh, to basically track uh, in, in broad terms the overall level of funding uh, that would be available uh, south of the border uh, because we do operate within that we will be operating within that competitive environment um, so that's the, the funding but secondly then it's how you use that funding uh, to actually drive and encourage and support uh, productivity competitiveness environmental performance um, so, uh, and, and that's where uh, we, we will have that flexibility and that scope as a fully devolved matter to ensure that we use that funding wisely, uh, we achieve real impact. Uh, and also it's, it's almost like a, a virtual, uh, virtuous circle uh, because if we can show impact, we can show we're making a difference, um, then it makes it easier to actually argue for the funding. Um, so uh, the, the, the two elements really do, uh, you know, have to be integrated. Do you see any tension or contradiction uh, between moving away from perhaps an area-based scheme to towards a production model, but but that not force farmers to focus more on production, whereas now on the area area-based scheme they are incentivized to uh, engage in cross compliance and maintaining their area they manage in good agriculture environmental condition? Um, well, cross-compliance isn't just a, an area-based uh, concept. Yeah. Uh, it will apply uh, regardless uh, of uh, on, on the current model, uh, whether it's a coupled heritage payment or an area-based payment or uh, any of the area-based payments uh, that exist uh, on, on, on Pillar 2. So uh, it's, it's not just a, uh, uh, an area-based uh, issue. Um, but I think that's, this is where it's, it's back to the, where do you actually want to move as an industry uh, and what are the best tools that you can use to actually move forward um, if you are looking across that, uh, those, those pillars of productivity, resilience, uh, etc. Uh, and it's design uh, an overall framework that actually moves you forward. Um, and in, in, in doing so, we, we don't have to necessarily constrain ourselves to what we've done before. Uh, 
and but we have that flexibility and that freedom to actually consider what will work uh, for us. What are you looking in there for? I just in relation to cross compliance, I just would like an assurance that in any new guidelines that is the industry's made, made aware and made very clear to them. I think in the past there's been some very hefty fines in relation to cross compliance that my eyes and many in the industry is very unfair. <coughs> because many farmers and many in the industry didn't fully realise the consequences of say for instance late testing. So people lost and, and I, I, I realise that it's important to test in time. No issue with that whatsoever. But I think in relation to that was the fines for intentional breaches up to fifty percent of single farm payment and some farmers lost as far as twenty five thousand. Uh, and um, I think if those farmers that I knew that absolutely wouldn't happen. I didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. I realised once the new guidelines once the new guidelines are, are brought put in place it should be made very clear to the farmer the situation. And, and if it is made clear then there's no excuse. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, communication is always going to be very important. Yeah. But in the past, it hasn't happened. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I suppose we could we get into a debate. Uh, yeah, yeah. But by, by the time somebody has incurred a breach on TB testing, for example, I think it's is it seven or nine letters they will have received. So, um, a lot of them would deny getting all those letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's that's sort of looking back. I think the the, the focus here is on looking forward, uh, to ensure yeah. that we have a a proportionate and effective uh, regime. Um, and I think, you know, we are looking at, uh, at cross compliance. It, I think it, we have to. It should not be seen as a mechanism for punishment. It should be seen as part of an overall framework uh, that actually delivers positive outcomes. Yeah, but I mean, it was an argument I had with many at the time, but on, on their letter, it said, it said on the letter that late testing may affect your basic farm payment. It, it wasn't may, it did act, you know, so. Well, it was I, I, I would argue that was fair warning. Well, I will say this to you, uh, the, the wording was changed on that significantly mm -hmm. when pressure was put on, so if it was, if it was fair, it was changed. I can assure you of that, and you, I'm sure you're fully aware of that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we really need to move on. We have a few uh, witnesses coming for the committee here. I want to thank Mark, Norman, and Rosemary for coming here this morning. Um, very informative, and thank you very much for taking a very wide range of questions over the course of the last hour. Thanks. So, um, sir, you are free to repeat. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a. Oral, oral session now from the UFU and uh, NAPA. The briefing paper is a 229 of the, 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 the pack. Uh, it's, it's, it's page 230232. We have Ivor Ferguson, the Ulster Farmers Union, David, um, who, to, Ivor's the President, David Brown, the Deputy President of UFU, Wesley Aston, Chief Executive Officer of UFU, um, James Lowe here, yeah, the Chairman of NAPA, Sean McCauley. The uh, vice um, chair of the Napa. <coughs> Let's just get seated there. <coughs> well, um, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Ivor Ferguson from the Ulster Farmers Union. First of all, uh, I want to thank you, Chair, and the members for giving us the opportunity to. Uh, to discuss these issues that we have before us today. And, and also, um, I just want to say welcome to the fact that the Assembly is back and up and running. And that it's a great opportunity for us now to shape uh, an agricultural policy that, that delivers for us, not only for our farmers, but for the agri-food sector in general. Uh, now, we'll have um, lots, of, uh, lots of concerns, but I just wanted to concentrate uh, on two issues, mainly one, uh, agricultural support, and also, secondly, a standard in relation to a new trade deal going forward. Now, um, when it comes to support, we certainly need a policy to replace the cap system. Now that we're now that we've left the EU, and um, we've had uh, many discussions over the last two or three years with George Eustace, and also before that with Michael Gove, and um, they assured us that uh, uh, an area-based payment. Uh, to, to them would be very difficult for them to argue a case for an area-based payment to the Treasury. 
In other words, farmers, uh, we as farmers would have to earn um, any support that we're going to get. So, um, bear all that in mind, um, three years ago when this was first discussed, uh, we went around uh, our members uh, throughout Northern Ireland, we, as I say, we're, as you know, we're an lobby organisation with 11,500 members. And uh, <coughs> we wanted to um, to get their views on area based payments and where they would actually want to be positioned in the future. So, as a result of that, we did produce this um, discussion document, uh, which we did make available to all our political parties at that time. And um, one of the main points that came out of that was that uh, farmers uh, <coughs> uh, weren't all that happy with area based payments because. Um, they felt it was a system that uh, rewarded uh, large landowners and uh, didn't, re didn't reward people who were necessarily doing all the work and producing the goods. So uh, really, to sum up, what they said to us was farmers wanted to be rewarded for activity. And whether that be production activity or environmental activity, that's where the farmers wanted to go. But. Um, as has already been mentioned, and you raised yourself, uh, uh, Chair, there um, a few minutes ago, uh, we certainly can't be disadvantaged with our uh, uh, farming colleagues uh, south of the border. We need a level playing field, of course, on the island of Ireland. And um, so in that way, we would certainly need to track uh, the payments south of the border. But that doesn't mean to say that we'll pay it out the exact same way. As long as the farmers get support, we certainly need the support. Uh, and that has been brought home to us recently with the figures that have just been produced of farm incomes of around two, 290 million, which would equate roughly to the amount of payments that comes in. So it's a stark reminder of the importance of payments. So our farmers certainly uh, want, we need the support, uh, but not necessarily in an area based payment. The other thing I just want to major on um, is the standards. And uh, the standards is something that uh, is very, very important to us. I mean, we in Northern Ireland produce our, uh, our products to a uh, high standard. Uh, we have a baseline of uh, red tractor quality assurance uh, a scheme, which would be our base. Um, and the other thing is we need to bear in mind is that at least 50% of what we produce is going across to the mainland uh, market. And in some um, some of our products um, and sectors, it's a good bit more than that. Uh, the major retailers uh, on the mainland, um, they recognise the uh, high quality of the food that we produce on the Red Tractor standards. Uh, they, they do recognise that. And uh, more importantly, consumers recognise that. And if there was a change to the standards, um, uh, that would have a major impact uh, for us here. And that comes down to a, the trade deal that's going to be negotiated, or any trade deals, let them be with Australia or the US or whatever. So if there was any lowering of standards, uh, that would leave us in a very poor position here in Northern Ireland as farmers uh, for what we produce. Lowering of standards automatically means um, lowering of costs. And we must bear in mind that our cost of production here will still be um, linked to the EU. Or will be linked to the EU regulations, so it would be we would be in a very poor position with our arm behind our back if we had a, a worked a certain standards and yet a, a, try to market food in a, in an area where the standards were lower. Um, the and I just want to say as well, going back to the support, you know, uh, these trade deals, um, if they work well for us, that would be one thing. But if they work against us. <coughs> We would certainly need active support uh, in that situation to contend with the difficulties that we might face in the marketplace. Um, I suppose the other thing, just uh, if we diverge um, away from where we are, uh, there will be restrictions uh, and a, a bureaucracy through export certificates going across from Northern Ireland into the UK and into the mainland market and vice versa. So um, <coughs> that would all be add to a cost and uh, unfortunately <coughs> at the moment there is some evidence that uh, some mainland companies now are starting to source a bit of product <coughs> on the mainland rather than come here. Uh, to look for product and so it's not just uh, something that might happen in the future it is happening in the moment and it's a major concern for us so those are our two main areas of concern support and standards on the trade deal so that's 
I just, I just want to, I'll try and answer any questions you have on that. Um, thank you, Ever. Uh, we're, that's with James. Yes, yeah, that's him. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I wouldn't be familiar with too many of you. Uh, my name's uh, James Lowe. I'm chairperson of NIAPA. I'm supposed to be the second organisation, second voice for the farmers in the six counties here. Um, where I'm supposed to have taken over the role a couple of years ago. Um, my dead time job, I'm sort of an ordinary farmer, beef and a milk farmer. Um, we, like I mean, I'm very aware of, of uh, what's going on. I mean, with our members, um, there's a lot of concerns. I have touched on, on a few of them. We would have major concerns <coughs> regarding on funding as well. Um, and basically, I know we're here to talk about the bill, but there's um, and future trade deals. Um, Copy has mentioned over here. He's mentioned points there to uh, our civil servants, senior civil servants, who I might add are doing a good job. You know, you can appreciate what they have been doing. In, in the absence of a, of a government, um, you know, for food security, um, the the uh, the level of, of um, income which has been depleted over the last two years, 26 percent um, farmers' income has come down. Uh, the the support, um, 280 million, basically is is uh, without it, there is no there is no farm income. You know, we have all families to rear and. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's just the, the income isn't there. And um, Mr. Lowe, if you just want to elaborate on anything, certainly I'm happy to do so. Okay. Um, thank you very much, James. Okay. Um, <coughs> I want to thank both of you for that presentation there. Um, I also want to recognise the power of the voice that the organisations have been providing for uh, the farming and rural communities here uh, in the north and I've been tracking and following a lot of the work that you have been, have been doing. Um, I suppose in terms of uh, like an, an open question, question almost, um, I know there's, there's varying views on what form a future farm support would take. Would you have, a, would you have any views uh, in terms of what form that should take? I'm also conscious that under the withdrawal agreement as well, that there there may be a, an upper cap in terms of in terms of what can be actually spent from the budget uh, for say couple payments. Uh, I think the minister said in the assembly this week that the cap uh, that can be spent is between eight and fifteen percent in terms of what you may be able to spend on couple payments from the pot that's available here. So bear in mind our um, requirements under the withdrawal agreement and the protocol for here. Um, <coughs> what, do you have a vision of what ship future payments might take uh, for the North? Well, maybe I could just come in there and say that um, one of the things is that, uh, <clears throat> as we did mention, we, we didn't want to come away from area-based payments altogether. So uh, we would like to think that we would still repay, retain um, some sort of an area-based payment. Uh, we could call that a resilience payment or a vol volatility payment. Uh, we didn't set any uh, figures on that, but we would probably envisage that that may be around from anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the of what we get at the moment. Uh, and how farmers um, <coughs> would build on that would be a uh, they could have um, a, we could build in various schemes such as welfare schemes or environmental schemes um, to, to so that a farmer could add to that to come back to what his original payment was. And uh, again. That would be uh, open to the farmer's uh, farmer's own decision. I mean, uh, if a farmer wanted to get a young farmer wanted to get very involved in doing animal welfare schemes and uh, animal health plans for, say, for his dairy cows or suckler cows or whatever, or environmental schemes, you know, we'd like to think that there would be a possibility if, for the effort that was made that we could maybe get back to even more of a payment than he was getting in the past. So that's how we would envisage our schemes going forward, and we certainly do. Um, <coughs> We, we, we do fully understand that we have vulnerable sectors like suckler cows and sheep, and that we know that we're, we're all restricted to an average of, you, as you say, of maybe 13%, somewhere between 8 and 15 mm. of a cap payment. But all those things we will have to revisit our members again and get a discussion uh, started on that, and how actually we will put figures on, on all these uh, uh, details that we have in place. Uh, 
Sorry, if I can come in there. <coughs> we don't want to rush into designing a policy at this stage until yeah. we see how the protocol rolls out and how the trade deals roll out. And we may actually need extra support, never mind the existing level of support, depending on how those happen. So if we actually design something at this stage, which we, the Department of Agriculture, all have ideas on, uh, it, it's wrong until we see the outcome of those, but I certainly think that we need to try and go back to the issue about productive efficiency, environmental efficiency, activity, all those key principles as part of a process going forward. So uh, I'm taking from what you're saying there that your preference would be <coughs> rather, than, rather than us um, to rushing to try to put together uh, our own uh, bill for here, that you would, your position would be that we would continue through this LCM route until touch time if we have the time to do our own yeah. well, uh, um, well, there's a couple of points, a couple of points there, uh, uh, Chair. Is the first thing is, uh, and we've talked about uh, these trade deals that are going forward, these trade deals are going to have a, a, a major bearing on what we need as regards uh, support. That's number one. The second thing is that um, going forward, uh, any of these new plans and schemes and things like uh, looking at soil, um, um, the health of our soils and all that sort of thing, there's no reason why we couldn't start that process and pilot some schemes going forward. I think we would be quite keen to do that, but on an overall basis we'll need to wait and see how our trade plans uh, go forward. So if, sorry, if I could just make one wee comment on that, and that's, uh, you know, to, to not lose sight of the fact that, you know, based on 2018 figures, uh, you know, the single farm payment or pay, payment coming in was 80%. In the current year, 2019, it is 100% plus. Yeah. So, in effect, anything that moves money from from farming income, because fundamentally the, the single farm payment ha is, uh, at, at present, it is the farming income, and therefore if it's moved to other uh, measures, it's in effect reducing the income directly to farms. Uh, Declan, can I just say on, on, on the issue of, of trade deals, uh, we need to link climate change into that because we can't have companies and others running to the other side of the world to import food when we have a supply on our own doorstep and our farmers are losing out because of that. So, you know, this idea of trade deals may be fine, but you can't run off to the Paris Climate Change Conference or the conference in Japan or here, sign up to, to all this green uh, measures that you're going to put in place and then turn around and bring food from the other side of the world when you have food on your own doorstep. So there, when we talk about the trade deals, and I think Wesley's right in what he's saying, we need to wait to see where that's going, but government must be held to account if they're going to do trade deals for food on the other side of the world and clearly contravene with climate change and, and other issues that they have signed up to. Yeah, so what you're saying is it would be an absolute contradiction to enter into a trade deal where you'd import food from the other side of the world, which is a far higher yes. carbon footprint than yeah. what you could produce locally. Well, when, when we are, within the EU, almost self-sufficient, taking the EU, I know we have to export a lot to the GB market and it's vital for us to have that market, but you know, that GB market needs our produce, so why, you know, would we lose out to uh, a product coming in that may not meet the standards? Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, and we heard Norman earlier talking about having to clearly stay to them standards, and we do have to stay. I mean, we produce some of the best food in the world, yeah. so why will we allow? So I think to hold on the trade deals uh, where we would want to see it coming from, we would very much want to see the climate change uh, and environmental issues being brought in there. The um, move. Could, could I just right. add oh, sorry, ever. Um, in that uh, <clears throat> we in the Ulster Farmers Union work very closely uh, with the other uh, four, the other three unions in the region, the different regions, England, Scotland, Wales, and uh, uh, on the standards which covers all these environmental issues, um, we have a major rally organised in Westminster where we are going to highlight that, and indeed we're bringing a, a number of farmers across from Northern Ireland to take part in that. There and highlighting the standards and the um, climate change uh, conditions related to those standards. I also just wanted to say that we did write to the uh, Prime Minister and uh, on uh, standards and uh, climate change uh, issues and uh, we got all the environmental groups, in fact 63 environmental groups stood alongside us uh, and signed up the letter to to the uh, Prime Minister to just to cover all those areas so, and emphasise again the importance of the quality and the standards of our food. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to move now to the members. There's a few people, uh, a fair number of members, want to ask some questions. Morris? Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
you've alluded to and what I was going to ask you anyway is, and that's in the food standards I think we've got the highest food standards not just in Europe but in the world and uh, I'd be keen to see those high standards maintained but under the new pro protocol I, my worry would be that the standards would be less than what we actually have here at the minute so how do you see uh, the flexibility to work towards your market whilst, whilst maintaining your very very high standards and not succumbing to EU standards which may be lower or market driven standards from outside and a World Trade Organisation uh, example could be a lot lower than what we have here. Well, as we've already um, been discussing, you know, um, we certainly don't want to see the standards drop in any way. I mean, that's our major, major issue, and a major issue for us in Northern Ireland. So, um, if if those standards fell or dropped in any way, that would be a problem to us. And as I did mention earlier, you know, it would be a double double problem to us because we would be linked to the EU uh, st uh, regulations here, so we couldn't drop our cost of production. So. So it would be it would be a major issue for us, and uh, it's something that we have been lobbying government um, on continually in this last 12 months because the agricultural bill, um, when it uh, came out, uh, there's no there's no mention of standards in it, and um, we have been pressing for some legislation around our standards, but uh, to date. You know, there's always our government has always very good reasons why that is <coughs> the case, and that is a major concern for us as you say. Just <coughs> sort of money the future. Uh, uh, do you see the uh, any impact on the the animal traceability or identification could cause any dilution in the high standards we have here? Um, well, the, 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 the traceability. I mean, we have a good, a very good, as you say, a traceability system here. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we don't see why that that would have to continue. You know, so from that point of view, I don't see that that would be a major issue for. Us. Okay. Sean, do you uh, want to pick up on that point? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I see our, our, our department here uh, does have, uh, you know, they, they, they say there are poten potential issues with the bill, and it's a, the identification and traceability of animal um, concerns that the Secretary of State does not need to seek consent from the devolved administration before making regulations in relation to the new statutory rule of AHDB. Now, we would have difficulties with AHDB uh, because obviously they're based in the UK, uh, and I don't think that they would take into account perhaps our situation here. Um, we also uh, would like to make the point that uh, we, we, we noticed that, that uh, the, the food security report would, would be every five years. We feel that whilst uh, there doesn't need to be a report perhaps every 12 months, there needs to be an update that needs to be looked at on a regular basis. We can't leave food security for a period of five years uh, and there may be you know, something happening along the line and we don't have the ability to go in there and deal with that. So whilst uh, we have concerns, as I say, with that, uh, that, that five year, we would like to see at least a, an update uh, or review on it uh, uh, every 12 months. Uh, and with regards to, uh, as I say, our own department are saying there, you know, that they have uh, potential issues with the bill to do with the identification and traceability. And I mean, our AFIS system and all that was set up here was ahead of the pack uh, and, and tracing animals and, and keeping an eye on animals. So we don't want to shall we say, let that go, uh, that, what we have here, and, and we would have concerns with an organisation like AHDB coming in to, to do a lot of that. Thanks. Okay, are you okay, Morris? Have you... Yeah, I'm happy enough, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Sean. William? Thank you, Mr Chairman, and you're very welcome along. It's good to see, as you said, the, the Assembly up and running again, and somewhere to come to the area issues and, and concerns. Uh, on couple payments, uh, there are sectors that are struggling at the moment more than others, uh, and on uh, this side of trade deals and all the rest, uh, have you used any major issue with support, couple support for some of those sectors? No, I, I don't think so. But uh, one of the things is, and I would have to say that we haven't really uh, went back round our farmers again to discuss this. Uh, but this is something that our beef and lamb committee, for example, are looking very closely at. So we will have to go back and uh, certainly revisit that. But that's something that will be up for discussion, and certainly it's a very important point because there are there are vulnerable sectors. But we have other vulnerable sectors too, like of course, like the animal as well. Absolutely. 
Okay. William, if I could just maybe add to that, I mean, um, I, I sit on both those committees, both the, the Beef and Lamb and the Hill Farming Committee, and, and I would say there, there's been a fair movement even uh, amongst the Hill Farmers on the basis that concern, obviously, that the ANC has been lost to them. And that's something <coughs> that UFU has, has obviously campaigned to have reinstated, uh, alongside uh, the fact that, uh, obviously, if there is a movement, whether that be a percentage movement or whatever, away from uh, an area-based payment, that, uh, well, I suppose really in terms of, of where we currently are, if we're looking at something going forward that needs to support, and, and you, you alluded to, you know, sucklers, uh, sheep, and that, I suppose, in that respect, um, I mean, the figures fr from DERA, uh, you know, even in the past year, showing where total income uh, from direct payments of 29,000 and the actual profitability or margin on those farms of 16. Uh, thousands. So, and in effect, they're using half of their single farm payment to keep farming. So, so those farmers are saying, well, if there's something can bring money towards cattle and sheep, uh, we're in a different place uh, to where we were previously, where uh, obviously it, it was to their benefit maybe to have it on, on an acreage payment. If, if there's going to be movement of money from acreage, as I say, perhaps a percentage movement, um, there is certainly an openness uh, amongst those farmers to look at the possibility of payments. Uh, towards the, the sucker and sheep sector specifically. Uh, William, can I can I just uh, come in on that and say that um, whilst we we fully support uh, support coming to, to to the sectors that need it, um, we need to be careful with subsidies going directly onto livestock. Uh, we had suckler cow subsidies before, and there was others within the food chain too quickly to adjust the end price of the beef <coughs> in reflection of what. The farmer was getting the support, and I think we have saw that recently in the south as well, with various schemes they have brought in, and their beef price has slumped. And some of the organisations there are now perhaps, <coughs> which they can't directly link it. They're saying, you know, the farmer's getting this. So I, I'm not saying for one minute, you know, the, the suckler industry does need support, but we we need to be careful, and we need we need to also also think of the long term here. Is this a long term solution to where this industry is going? Because we have the opportunity now to, to, to start anew, and it has to be a long term uh, situation that we're looking at. Can I let John in here? Chairperson, a question to I'm both Ivor and James. Ivor, uh, you've uh, put a lot of emphasis on standard, and of course, you are aware that the, the people who wrote this bill might never have heard of Northern Ireland or perhaps thought it was Rockwell <coughs> because the opportunities for us to market our own products uh, are so so limited. But in terms of standards, you know, to me standards was at one time the house in which the animal was slaughtered, but today it's far more than that. And I'm sure since we <coughs> sat down here this morning, Several acres of the Amazon has been cleared uh, to provide grazing uh, for animals. It will pass all these standards. And of course, Britain, with 70 million of a population, will, will welcome that. So you're going to Westminster. Uh, how do you intend to get across the message that agriculture in Northern Ireland is quite different from Britain? Well, <clears throat> I think the, the first thing is when it comes to standards, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, when it comes to quality assurance, you know, like red tractor quality assurance schemes, uh, the same standards apply in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So we are on the same page as regards uh, quality assurance schemes. And the quality assurance um, takes into uh, account uh, animal welfare and and all those standards as well. So we're on the same page there. And the major retailers, as I said earlier, um, they do respect the red tractor assurance scheme. They support us in that respect. Um, when it comes to looking at um, the standards going forward, as I say, this is one of the major concerns we have. Uh, where we in the past we had to go directly uh, to the effort committee. Uh, 
that which is um, chaired by Neil Parrish, and they fed our concerns uh, directly in <coughs> into the government for us. Uh, now we have our assembly up and running, and our own minister and our, uh, uh, our elected representative. So you know we, we have to rely on on everybody around the table as well going forward to support us on that. So those are the way the, the messages that we're getting across to try and support our standards going forward. And you rightly say this is this, the standards are so important to us, and. Uh, we would want to uh, make sure that any future trade deals takes our standards fully into consideration where that comes from uh, a beef from the Amazon uh, basin or wherever it's coming from the US or wherever so those th th that trade deal you know we would want to make sure that our standards are right in there and that they can't they can't lower our standards because it would be so detrimental to us here in Northern Ireland okay so standards is is one part of the the story marketing them yeah. so that the consumer understands and is better informed of why he or she uh, should buy Northern Ireland products. Would you encourage the uh, development of cooperation between the different groups involved in our food industry? Well, I, I suppose uh, when it comes down to um, marketing, and our, marketing our product, one of the things we're looking very closely at again is a marketing body here for Northern Ireland. Uh, and that's been looked at. It's been sitting on the shelf for, for the last three years. So uh, a marketing body is something that we would see as very important to us, uh, not only for the 65 or 70 million people, as you say, in the mainland where the bulk of our product goes, but also to look for new markets and to try and uh, shift some product uh, outside the um, the mainland GB market because it is a very competitive market with the retailers um, uh, competing with one another, it's a very competitive market. So, looking forward, we would look, <coughs> we would hope that the marketing body would be a big help to us going forward. So, that's something that we're looking very seriously at at the moment. The other thing is that um, when it comes, I said that uh, we um, do produce Evan to Red Tractor quality assured standards. Red Tractor have been spending a lot of money now on the home market to try and increase awareness of Red Tractor products. So, that's something that's very much uppermost in our mind. But another point is that, and I just want to mention it, in that uh, <coughs> up until this last few years, the major retailers did supply a big percentage of the shoppers of the shopping basket uh, for consumers. Uh, that that used to be 70 or 80 percent, and uh, the amount of money or the amount of product that the major retailers are selling has been dropping, and. Uh, the food service sector is taking up the slack, and there's more ready meals now and more convenience meals. And uh, they, they, those uh, those uh, food service sector uh, uh, processors don't necessarily uh, support red tractor quality assurance. So that's something that we would like to see. We would like to see some more legislation placed around the uh, governance of. Uh, our food service sector to point out where the where the meat and the products come from, same as what major retailers has to do. So those are things that we would be pushing for. Chairperson, <coughs> that's before moving on to James, I'd want to endorse what what you've said, and I hope that you support the assembly in ensuring that this rather limited role that I see we have in marketing is considerably enhanced, because as I say, we're quite different from from those in Britain. Uh, James, I was reading the other day by the experts that 25 per cent of farmers will disappear. Many of those are your members. <coughs> well, I mean, our member base is we're in excess of 3,000 members across the six counties. Um, we are getting it every day. Just the guys are just at their wits' end, struggling. You know, the tax, for example, this year they can't pay last year's tax bill is is one immediate thing at the moment. Um, the quality of the produce that they're, that they're presenting is, as Aver says, is, is second to none. Um, the, the, the market's supposed to, the, the, the quality thing is, is, is vital, and uh, our, our members have been, been hammered for it all the time um, by, by the bigger uh, cooperatives. The cooperatives seem to have, you know, it seems to be the VN and end of all of them, whatever they say is how you have to jump. Um, Regarding the assembly, again, can I echo the point that it's great to see locals here because I've sat in many a, a committee meeting with Whitehall officials and indeed um, previous environmental ministers, uh, Villiers and, and Cove, to, to mention a few. And it, it, it is embarrassing how little um, they actually knew of the workings of this place. 
So the profile of this place has to, you know, is is very relevant. I, you know, for the minister here to be able to, you know, put things in action himself and work. Um, the uh, regarding the, the again, our, our product, our, a lot of our members' product is going further afield, and as I was says, mainland Europe with our mainland England with um, milk products. Um, the, the board beer and, and red tractor do work closely together. I mean, the, the milk thing is just so intermeshed that it's, it's nearly impossible to, to uh, separate, as you alluded yourself, Chair. Um, so it's, it's, it's just it's a work in progress. And meanwhile, the, the, the profits, I mean, you seem to be demanding more, more um, quality, but net gain for the farmers, they're just struggling. Chairperson, just very finally. Uh, James, I live in the rural community. I'm not a farmer, but I'm very much aware that everything about me, in terms of the environment, the uh, wildlife, the idyllic situation and privilege to live in, didn't happen by accident. It was done by farmers. Where do you see this in the future? Well, th that uh, is a, a very relevant point. I mean, but if it's to do here from um, non farmers like yourself, and um, they are very appreciative of the spurns and what they see, and, and the morns and um, uh, beauty spots Spare and whatnot, right, right, right? And the, yeah, absolutely, Philip. Um, the clans. Um, but that, that again, you, that hasn't happened by accident. You know, you mean the sheep. Um, the, the, the hill farmers, I mean, are, are paramount on, on, on keeping the landscape in, in the condition that it's in. And um, we do, and again, Mr. Irwin, uh, your point you alluded to earlier about uh, um, cross compliance, vital as well. But, like, I mean, in the past, we have had members, has been, as indeed UFU, um, has had members, you know, uh, harshed, you know, by, by breach of cross compliance, alleged breach of cross compliance, where they see their neighbours down the road in an in industry getting away with pittance of fines. So, um, no, I do, <coughs> excuse me, no, I do take your point, Mr. Dallas, that's, that's very relevant and it, it certainly hasn't happened by accident. A lot of work, indeed, generations of work has been done and it's vital that, uh, again, how that's going to maintain that. Again, back to the chair, um, eight fifteen percent um, for for a, a cap for um, a small farmer. Really, I don't see how that's going to pan out. I mean, if I take for example a hillman with ten cows, I'm getting a ten percent cap for one cow. You know, it's, it's really it's no incentive. No. Uh, can I can I just say, John, to, to reply to you there, and I agree with, totally with what you said. Um, I mean, the, the family farm structure that we have in Northern Ireland. I think is also be best place to deliver for the environment, yeah, and the environmental issues that are coming forward. Yeah. But for that all to happen, we need to see profitability at the farm gate. Yeah. Now, as some of you know, some of the, uh, our organisation, along with others, has been working on on farm gate prices. And I think, whilst it's vitally important the other issues we're dealing with here today, if the farm gate price is not dealt with, it's, you're right, right in what you're saying, John. More farmers are going to disappear. So. We're going to move on here, folks. I'm conscious we have about 15 minutes left here, and we have five or six speakers left. So, if we just keep the, folk, the questions quite uh, focused, um, Rosemary. Yeah, I just want to. You're very welcome here, and thank you for your presentations. I, I'd just like to ask you um, to make your case. Do you think we would be better going or make a case? It's better to make a case for a Northern Ireland agricultural bill for us to have our standalone Northern Ireland agricultural bill and sort of have it based some something similar to the Welsh system at the moment in that there's a sunset clause and then gradually work, working to our own bill and um, you know and in, especially in relation to we've got two jurisdictions that we have you know with this with this border down the Irish Sea we have the Great Britain mainland to satisfy their rules and regulations then we have the Republic of Ireland also, and obviously we're trading with both, and both are very important to us. Well, I, I suppose the first thing I just want to say is that we certainly um, do acknowledge that uh, farming here in Northern Ireland is very different to farming in England and farming in Scotland as well. So from that point of view, we certainly would want to see our own policy here developed here for our Northern Ireland farmers and for certainly for uh, in. in including the agri-food business in general, like we'll have to be a, do, do, a, come up with our own scheme here for Northern Ireland. Um, <clears throat> I suppose going forward, looking at, uh, at the Welsh model and all that sort of thing, I suppose we have to be open-minded at the moment. 
uh, and um, and we've already talked about you know the implications going forward uh, and the implications of future trade deals and all that. What's that? How is that going to impact on us? And whether uh, the the the, um, the difficulties that we might face in dealing uh, with trading our produce across the Irish Sea from here to England and back again, you know. Those are all sort of things that we will have to bear in mind uh, and be open-minded about, and be uh, um, always uh, be recognise that if there's extra costs in the system, usually at the end of the day, it's, you, it's we as farmers end up paying those costs. So those are all things that we we'll certainly have to be uh, recognised going forward. David? Well, just just to add one short comment to that, and, and I suppose it's, it's around the fact, and we heard it earlier this morning on a number of occasions where uh, particular aspects of the bill were described as reserved matters. The difficulty we have, and, and it's been alluded to earlier today, for example, around migrant labour, we, we do not have the ability um, to have regional variation, and that's uh, and, and certainly a problem. Uh, and many examples, I'm sure, that we could go into in detail, but in truth, you know, Northern Ireland, and, and obviously we have lobbied and campaigned on that, that there were aspects of the bill that we needed to have some variation, and in obviously uh, some of those examples we do not. Yeah, and I suppose just to add to that again, uh, in discussion with our all unions, England, Scotland, Wales, and bearing in mind, uh, as we said, as we know, that we're a, a border, we're on border with the Republic of Ireland, we certainly do need a framework where we can work together so that uh, there's no economic impact, whether it's in the food market or whatever, right across all our regions. So that's something that uh, we will have to have long discussions about about this, an overall framework. James, or? Um, well, sure, yeah. Well, we'd feel um, very much that uh, the articulation of the bill sort of leaves a lot to be desired for this region. Um, certainly what goes on across in GB is, is, is not relevant really to farming here, day-to-day -day farming, small farms. Um, again, as David alluded to, is, is the, the, the immigration or migration, um, labour and thing. you know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, what goes on over there is really not relevant here in, in certain aspects. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for being here. Um, I want to just apologise maybe for my ignorance at the, the start. This is a new sector to me in the agri-food, and I did, I'm well aware of the Ulster Farmers Union, certainly, um, but I wasn't aware of, of yourself, so it's nice to, to know that you're there as well. And well, I appreciate that. I know you, even though you're maybe, but you're still a consumer of agri-food, so you're certainly, yeah. playing your part. <laughs> the more local, the better as well. <laughs> but maybe what I ask, um, so we're hearing that a discussion paper was produced back in August 2018 between the department and the sector. Am I okay to assume that you were part of those conversations? Yeah. Um, great. So that was sort of looking at the potential framework for how we can mm. move forward. And I've already sort of mentioned earlier as well that it was notable that within the the bill as it is, we're not addressing sustainability issues, that we're not addressing our climate and our already um, agreed targets from there. So when we are hearing a lot about productivity moving forward, can you give me a sense of what that productivity would look like? Because, you know, we can't move back to models such as contained within the going for growth. You know, it's, it's, are we looking at intensification of farming? Are we looking at diversification? Can you give me a sense of what that is? Well, I suppose, Claire, firstly, I mean, I suppose as, as a layperson, uh, um, you know, uh, if, as uh, maybe a, one of the predecessors um, spoke there about a global event, you know, I think it's very important to remember that uh, food, uh, um, global food security, there is, I think it's only days of food um, reduction, you know, left. If, if there's a global event, before there'd be a food scarcity. And it's, it's like it's no coincidence that um, food security is so high up the, the, the agenda um, moving forward. Um, personally, a lot of our members would prefer to get paid for product, uh, productivity as opposed to working for a uh, burn envelope in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, the, the returns aren't there from the from the, the, the consumer. Um, so. You know the, the people like I, mean, I know like there's no stimulation in agriculture at the moment to bring a new generation 
in the industry, yeah. uh, which is, is, is sad. I mean, I've, I've three kids me, on my own, and none of them really, I wouldn't force any of look at any of them into it. No, I started 25 years ago. And, uh, you know, for an example, just again, a lay person like we were getting 25 pence for a litre of milk back then in 85. And today we're still getting that, you know. And there, there has been no talk of um, input inflation here at all, you know, um, and inputs have just have skyrocketed. So it is, it's not like for here, it's not a, it's not a, a one sock fits all case scenario here, you know. So it's. Um, are you some of the went through the light on? Ever, well, you, you, yes, um, I just want to um, come back to your reference about going for growth. I couldn't go back there. You know, I think we as farmers, uh, we are just like any other business. Uh, we have to be able to expand, you know, to survive, because if we're not expanding, if we sit still, we're going in real terms, we're going backwards. So uh, we really have to be able to expand our business. Now, how you actually do that? Is the main question, and you know, we certainly want to. We, we are really aware of the issues that we have as regards the environment, and um, we are already working with um, uh, environmental groups like Nature Matters. We're doing that these days as we speak. Uh, we, we, we have on our agenda certainly uh, by producing more, we should be able to do it with less inputs, so we're going to do more with for less. We also um, are uh, fully recognised that there will be new technology uh, on uh, go on new farming techniques where we will be able to look after the environment even better than what we're doing at the moment. And we do believe we have been looking after the environment pretty well. We, um, we have been part of the Greenhouse Gas Partnership now for 10 years in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's already been mentioned, the Sustainable Land Management um, committee. Uh, we have three farmers sit on that, and we're looking very closely at ammonia, uh, uh, the ammonia issues at the moment. So, looking forward, uh, we believe that uh, whereas we're looking after the environment today, we believe there's an awful lot more we can do, and we'll have plans to do that. And um, we are looking towards new technology, and know there's some new technology at the moment to handle slurry, and. Um, and uh, ammonia emissions. We're, we're looking at that new technology at the moment, and in fact, we're going to be discussing that with Deere very closely and with the NIEA. Uh, so, looking forward, I can see that we will be able to increase our production, but do it in a more environment-friendly way. And I think that's what our ambition has to be. So, if I could maybe just add to that, I suppose um, you know. What I've just said in relation to obviously our desire to, to uh, you know, have a more sustainable agriculture, um, but in terms of our supply in um, the marketplace, um, currently the UK is about 55% self-sufficient in pork and 75% self-sufficient in, in beef and in poultry. So going back to suppose the earlier point, and, and all of those uh, environmental organisations, uh, you know, s supported the case that we made that we d we don't want to see. That uh, other percentage uh, basically being imported from parts of the world where the standards are not at the level that they are within uh, the UK agriculture, and uh, I suppose yes, Northern Ireland uh, supplies you know some, somewhere in the region 50% of what we produce goes into the GB market, uh, and uh, you know percentage then uh, into the Republic of Ireland and on into the EU. But uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's being produced uh, to a standard that's not matched. And, and you know, if, if you want to take Greenhouse gases, for example, where uh, the level of greenhouse gases in, in both the UK and indeed ROA is uh, two and a half times less than the world average. So if we export production to somewhere else, uh, we're not globally doing the world any uh, favours because we're, we're actually producing it uh, at a standard that uh, is not matched by what we produce. Okay. Thank you very much. Will you give a brief, John? Yeah, I'll be brief, Chair. <coughs> um, lo lots of stuff around standards um, have been very ably covered, and, and I wish the, the panel and representatives as well would take that conversation around standards to, to Westminster and to the Prime Minister. Um, the uh, question I want to ask that perhaps hasn't been covered already, and make it quick because you've heard it earlier before I asked uh, earlier, you would have heard some of the questions to the Department about North South versus East West. and trying to get that framework right. Um, separate to tariffs, which are fairly self-explanatory, uh, and the risk they're in, are there any other issues in relation to the, the ease of movement in both directions that you'd like to add to the committee so that we can bear in mind as, as we monitor developments of the bill and, and other factors? 
Well, um, <clears throat> I suppose uh, when it comes to North South, I think that's pretty well covered in the in the protocol. You know, uh, we had major concerns around that in the past uh, when mm. it came to some products, particularly like uh, milk. But I think we'll have it uh, resolved uh, to a certain extent in that, say, a milk, 30% of our milk goes south over the border. Um, if it's a, um, if a, our concern was that um, in a southern uh, uh, milk processing plants, the question was, could they access um, the 52 trade deals that they have with other countries all around the world? Uh, that was a concern for us, but now we realise, or we're being told, that when the milk is changed, a um, substantially changed from liquid to a powder that that should solve the problems. Now, having said that, um, our processors in Southern Ireland would still be want to make sure that uh, that the uh, customers, let it be in China or Saudi Arabia or wherever it's going to be, will accept the, the product being as labelled as our R O I label on it. So there's still a slight concern, but I think generally we're happy enough for that. One of the things um, about going um, uh, east, west, and um, and west across to east, uh, we certainly have concerns about that. Uh, as I said, uh, we do realise at the moment that some of the companies on the mainland who have been doing business aren't doing the same level of business here in Northern Ireland because of bureaucracy, and they're concerned about about the bureaucracy and form filling and that going forward. And um, that has been brought home to us by some some. Um, College companies have been saying for the first time now in this last few weeks they have difficulty in securing backloads back to Northern Ireland. Now, that's a major concern for us because that would add to costs. And as I said earlier, uh, usually when it comes to costs, we as farmers end up uh, usually footing the bill. So I would, would like um, our <coughs> assembly to make all those concerns uh, uh, in Westminster, make those concerns for us on our behalf, that that's something that is a concern. And of course, if the trade deals are already mentioned, if those trade deals go against us, we may need even we would need even more support here, so that we're not disadvantaged here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the final one, I have to keep it very tight because maybe out of here is Philip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to get my hand up earlier. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I'm conscious of time, and I'm conscious that the questions that I, I was going to ask, in fairness, have been have been answered. I mean, I just want to thank you for your contribution. I think it was it was extremely useful. Uh, in, in all its parts, uh, and sometimes very, very informative. I mean, in terms of support, I, I think you're 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 talking to an open ear here. In terms, you know, we're all acutely aware of uh, the contribution level of support needs maintained, if not uh, improved upon, uh, for your industry, but also for the, the local economy. Uh, I mean, the north side, <coughs> a rural uh, economy driven from from agriculture. Uh, I mean, I. I sense the concern about uh, the trade deals and the standards. I mean, and just given the earlier conversation that we had, and I think it's run for it when we, when we were talking about migration and and the policies that seem to be imposed upon us. I mean, I think you're probably right to be concerned. I mean, I, I, I see a lot of what's happening here being driven by. Uh, I want to be careful with my words. Tory party policy. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're well aware of the things that, that the likes of Boris Johnson and our Conservatives said in the run-up to the election with regard to migration, but also with regard to trade deals. So, I mean, we, we certainly share your concern, and I think you're probably right to be concerned. I mean, I, I would have the opposite concerns of Morris uh, in terms of you know, dealing with higher standards. I mean, I, I suspect there, there are lots of people within the Conservative establishment who would be quite happy to import food with lower standards, and, and I mean that's going to cause havoc here. So I mean, it's great that you're working with environmental groups, uh, and it's great that you're doing all of that there. And I mean, as I say, without delaying us longer, I mean we support you in your endeavours, and and just hope that decisions are made that that support and and continue the the industry here in the north. Yeah. Well, th 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 thank you very much uh, for your comments. And I just do want to make the point, although support is very, very important to us and the standards in the marketplace. But at the end of the day, we as farmers, we would really like to, <coughs> we would really like to earn our money in the marketplace. You know, but the situation is so competitive at the moment that we we'll have to rely on outside support to do that. But we would ultimately like to be able to live stand our own two feet without support. But unfortunately, that's a long way away. Okay.
Folks, we're going to have to adjourn here now because we get out of here. So um, I want to thank you very, very much for coming along, giving that briefing um, from yourselves. Um, okay, and uh, and we have to suspend now for lunch. So thank you very much for making a trip up here, folks. Okay, we'll just suspend now.